Hey guys, welcome back. David Greenberg here, freedomvibe.art. And this is going to be a part two of the last discussion that you guys saw between Brandon, Brandon, Joe Williams, and myself, where kind of we we kind of dove in deep to some of the litigation that he's been doing, specifically with the, the Amex case. So if you haven't watched it already, definitely go watch the first episode because you're going to want to have that as foundational information. Um, and I'm particularly looking forward to hearing from Brandon because he hasn't even told me the full story of what the updates are. So I'm going to be learning this new stuff just like you are. So we're just going to kind of continue where we left off. How are you doing, Brandon? Good. How are you doing? I am doing really well, my friend. Uh, like I was telling you during the pre-show, I just launched my new project, conditionalacceptance.com. We did a workshop this last weekend on my birthday. We had about 18 people. They stayed the whole time, which was amazing. Wow. And uh, people got huge value from it. So I think we're off to a strong start. Excellent. Well, hopefully I can, um, this will be, this will be real killer for my audience because I've never, ever talked about Pacer anywhere ever because um, I wanted people to go and kind of figure it out on their own. So this is going to be, for, for my people, they're going to go absolutely ape shit over this particular video because the last one we did I've covered that on the Expanding Reality Show. I covered some of that with Dr. Andy Kaufman. Yep. Uh, I've covered some of that stuff other places, but this this episode that we're about ready to do is going to be my premiere uh, pacer and and basically like my first introduction into you know uh, the docket and and that kind of thing. A little bit more advanced, um, but but very very useful. So I'm very excited to get started. That's awesome, man. I can tell you're enjoying this process. Oh, yeah. At first I wasn't, but now I am, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> okay. The honesty is good. Yep. At first it was very, very overwhelming. Uh I felt like I had been hit by a truck. Uh, but now now I'm now I'm I, I got my feet, you know, planted at least. And once you get some basic pieces of information that are really important and you kind of plant your feet down every, you know, from that point forward, any other confusions and stuff, it's a lot less. Uh, intense, you know. Yeah, it's like anything in life. As you achieve mastery through practice, you you reach a certain level of competence where it's just like breathing. Yeah. Amazing. All well, right. this is well, going to be a long presentation. In... So you ready to get rolling? <laughs> yeah, don't keep us in suspense. Uh, I already gave you permission to share screen, so you don't have to ask that for that. Excellent. So here is the Williams and Williams Law Firm. Okay. And you're going to go to current and previous litigation yep. and you're going to see the case numbers and all that good stuff. So this, this video is all going to be all about how do we navigate Pacer? Okay. Okay. So pacer.uscourts.gov. Okay. We're going to do, um, so there's different things that you can do. You can sign up for an account. This is going to be the first thing that you're going to be signing up for. Uh, I am not going to cover this. This is, if you can't figure this out, then I don't know how you feed yourself. <laughs> So case search only is probably going to be what almost everyone is going to be filing for attorney filers and then non attorney filers. This means um, filers, meaning like you're actually filing into a case as the plaintiff or as a as a witness or as an interested party or whatever. Right. So these two are going to be for a very small number of people who are either involved in litigation currently on the federal level or for people who are looking to litigate on the federal level, like what I'm doing, you're going to be using these types of accounts. But for 97% of people probably, or 95% for now, uh, and I do believe you can always change your account style later, you're going to do case search only. Okay. Then after that, you're going to have access to search for a case. So now you're going to be able to do uh, all sorts of cool stuff, right? Now, uh, we go to search for a specific court. We're going to go to Pacer login. All right. And we're going to log in. Where would you like to go? Okay. Now, uh, my case is, I shouldn't do this. I think it's, uh, my case is in, I think it's Central District. Let me see here. Yeah. United States uh, Central District of California. Western Division. Okay. So we can type in California. And this is the same Amex case that we've been talking about, right? Yeah. 
Okay, great. We can get into my other cases. I have one in Minnesota and one in Texas, but um, we'll just stick with the Amex case. It's got the most exciting shit happening on it, in my opinion. Awesome. Uh, so you can see here, we've got the California Central District. We've got the Western District. We've got the Northern District and the Southern District. So you got to ask yourself. Now, this is more like Joey Kimbrough, my right hand man. He knows how all that works and which one do you file into and blah, 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 blah. But uh, whatever, if you can't figure it out, th that's a whole nother video. I'll be doing a whole a lot of videos on this later when I kind of fully nail all this down and how all this works. But for now, I know my case is here. Um, so we're going to log in. Um, as you can see, the the system that they use uh, looks like it's from 1995. OK, and that's just the way it is. There's nothing I could do about that. Uh, this is just a notice page. It's probably some... It is. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to go to the click on this link to go to the document filing system. OK, yeah. now now this is the system that you are going to see when you log in. OK, so. Um, when you log in, you can, you have all these different things up top, right? You have, uh, civil, right? And I'm just trying to remember, uh, here's search. No, not search. I'm trying to remember how to do all this. Let's see here. Query. Yeah. So if you go to query, and we type in um, one of my case numbers. Oh, by the way, when you sign up for um, for Pacer, you'll get you you either have to type in um, your credit card information, and that will instantaneously verify your account, or you can request them you to send you a code. That's the code will it. come in the mail. You type in the code, and then as long as you spend less than thirty dollars per quarter. You never have to type in any credit card information into Pacer. It's free, under $30 per quarter. If you're looking up tons of cases and stuff and you go above that $30 per quarter, you will need to type in your credit card information in order to access Pacer, okay? So I just copied and pasted that case number, find this case. Um, okay. Let's see here. Oh, oops. That's the wrong state. So we're gonna um, we're gonna find my case number here. User error. <laughs> I'm not super familiar with all this. That's why I haven't talked about it too much, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay, we're still having troubles. Okay, so let me see here. Weird. I think you just you just didn't copy and paste it. No, I did, and it cut it short. Interesting. Oh, wait, maybe run query. So you just type in the case number, it'll cut it, and then you hit run query. Let's see what happens. Okay. So, uh, sorry, I, I I like I said, I I haven't talked about paster stuff too much because I'm I'm still learning it myself. Okay. So you, I copied, I pasted it, and then it cut it, and then I just hit run query on the bottom because you can see, uh, it's like an old nineteen nineties program where you have to, yeah, press and you can query. you can you can search for causes of action, name, yeah. prisoner ID, you can search for all sorts of information, but keep in mind you're only searching within the um, the. The jurisdiction that you're looking in the 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 central district of california yeah. federal cases okay? okay if you want to do state cases or, or or other types of cases you have to search and i'm sure there's ways you can go online and you can type in um god knows what what like maybe brandon joe williams v american express maybe if you just type that into okay so okay. so this pops right up negotiable instrument case right Oh. <laughs> there's a there's a reddit about me that's hilarious so um sovereign you can get... citizen of course they couldn't even get that right <laughs> so fucking ridiculous so fucking ridiculous i'll have to check that out it's yeah. funny um so we have here uh brandon joe williams versus american express company right so you can take this case number right here so you can type in any case number 
Uh, you could type in anything. You could type in, let's say, for, you know, a lot of people, oh, Wesley Snipes, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Wesley. Wesley Snipes v. United States. Or actually, it would be United States because they're the plaintiff, v. Mm. Wesley Snipes. Okay. So if we go down to find the case number, um, let's see, let's see. Court of Appeals. Court of Appeals. Um, so is the docket number the same as the case number? You know, I don't know. Let me see. Case. Seems to have a similar format. So let's see if we can find this docket number. Let's see if we go to query. We would need to go back, I think. We would need to go back to Pacer. And then go to search by a specific court, Pacer login. Where would you like to go? We would go to um, Court of Appeals, 11th Circuit. Appeals. Oh, man, I am not that good at this. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Appellate Court, um, 11th Circuit. Let's see if this will work. There you are. U.S. Court of Appeals, 11th Circuit. Submit. Interesting. So now we're going to go to the document filing system. Search for case information. Case number. Search. Okay, we do not have the correct. Let's see here. Oh, this is it right here. Maybe this is it. Let's see. Oh, whoops. I'm getting hit by this bar. Let's see. Let's try this. Okay. Let's try this. Okay. So I don't know how to find this case, but I know this is how you do it to some degree. Let's see if I can find this. But it looks like you were able to find your case, right? I saw it come up in the when you did when you yeah. did query. Wesley Snipes case number. Okay, let's try this. Okay. Middle District of Florida, case number here. Let's try that. Pacer, okay. Pacer login, where would you like to go? Middle District, Florida. Uh, middle District, let's try that. Middle District filing system. Um, okay, now we have this upper bar again. Now let's see if we can run a query. Slightly different for each one, it looks like. It's different for each one. Find this case. Ba-boom! Thank God. I look like a fucking idiot here. Okay. So now we're going to click on, I guess, this first one. I don't know. There's a couple here, but we're going to click on this first one. We're going to go down to run query. Okay, boom. Now we are officially inside the Wesley Snipes case, okay? Mm. So uh, USA versus Snipes et al. This is from April 5th, 2006. Now, these are all the different things that you can do involving the case. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to docket report. This is, and then this is asking you what filings into the case would you like to see? And we're going to type in absolutely nothing and we're going to hit run report. We want to see everything ever filed into the case. Mm. So we're going to go down, down, down. Has all the information about all the lawyers, all the good stuff. Um, blah, 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 blah. He was, he was imprisonment, 12 months, blah, 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 all that stuff. Okay. Now go down, go down, go down. 
bunch more information, a lot of information. Wow. Okay. Okay. Here we go. This is what a docket looks like. Okay. So these, this is every single thing ever filed into the case and it goes by these numbers. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you can see they're clickable and we're going to get into that in just a moment. Okay. All the way down. I know this is overwhelming, but there's no way to to show this or explain this without going through this. This is just kind of the way it is. You will probably be overwhelmed. Okay, get over it. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. So obviously he lost too. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't need to be this many filings, but we're just taking a look at a very large case that was obviously mishandled because he lost what in a case that really it's really not that hard to to win in a case like this in my opinion i mean you have sure. to know what you're doing right so this is a, a obviously a massive case i mean my my case we'll look at it um you know so we're 602 filings into the case okay now let's say we wanted to now if you wanted to download this whole case it, it would cost you way more than 30 dollars like i don't know probably hundreds and hundreds of dollars i don't even know how much okay but let's go ahead and just download the original uh, indictment. It says here indictment, right? We're going to click on this little three. Now it's telling me that um, it's it's going to give me this document. It's four billable pages and it's going to cost me 40 cents. Would you like, basically, would you like to do that? Are you accepting charges shown? Yes, I am. View document. Boom. So here is what I would assume, because it's the first thing, one of the first things filed into the case. This is the original indictment uh, on Wesley Trent Snipes, Douglas P. Rosile, and Eddie Ray Kahn, right? And this indictment was, uh, let's see here. Uh, um, they did make... Uh, and present cost to be made and presented and aided and abetted the marketing and presentation of materially false, fictitious, and fraudulent claims for payment upon and against the United States, presented to the United States Department of Treasury, Internal Revenue Service, IRS, uh, to uh, knowing that the claims were fict were false, fictitious, and fraudulent. Yeah, so 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 in 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 fictitious cases and fraudulent cases and broad cases and stuff like that. Um, uh, intent is a big part of it. So they're saying that in this indictment, it was a knowing that the claims were fictitious, fraudulent, et cetera, right? So um, you can read through this and you can read that this is the original indictment, okay? And you can download this document. Uh, this document is a PDF that is opened up in my browser, you can see. So I can just hit the download button here or the print button here. So so basically what what I'm trying to get at with this is that litigation in 99% of all litigation in this country is like a, a televised UFC ring. It's a little bit hard to find out which channel, which fight is on, but basically like every single piece of paper and every single thing, I believe even um, transcripts of like hearings and stuff like that can be ordered by anyone. I, I don't know that for sure, but I'm like 90% sure anyone can order transcripts. Transcripts are pretty expensive, by the way. You can spend two or 300 bucks on a set of transcripts for like one hearing. But my point is, it's all accessible and it's completely public and it is essentially warfare. So what you're looking at is you're looking at the system of which is the TV channel of which you can pay per view uh, to view all of the blows and, and attempts to defend and 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 swings of the axe and punches and, and pile drivers and defensive moves and everything else. In my opinion, and the way I would describe all this, that's what this is. Okay. Now. Okay, so um, hang on. I've got a question. Yeah. And hopefully we're going to see your case. We're going to search again by your case because I'm very interested to see it personally. I'm sure the audience is too. Yeah. Um. How likely do you think you it is that you will actually end up physically in court versus just dealing with all this on paper? Um, 
I, I would love to because I, I need to learn. So I would like to try to uh, get there as quickly as possible. Um, I don't recommend that you litigate if you're terrified of that. Um, but to answer the question, uh, I would say I have not gone to any court. We haven't even done. I did one meet and confer over the phone, audio only, one time with two attorneys in all four cases, and it's been two months. Everything else has all been paper into the docket. And what were, were that was that meet and greet or whatever it was? Was that for this Amex case or was that for a different case? No, that was for my very, very first case with uh, Compass Realty and Dan Hollerman. Yep. I remember when you described that one. Okay. So that was a meet and confer for that case. I've been trying to get a meet and confer done for the Amex case and the lawyers are going absolutely ballistic, which we can get into uh we can get into that now so so i'm gonna go i don't know of any better way to get out of this i could be again anyone watching this who may have experience with pacer it may look like i'm an idiot i pretty much am so that's okay i'm not i'm not attempting to i know the law pretty damn well uh i don't know pacer all that well so i am just want to be transparent so we're going to go back to the login i guess where would you like to go we're going to go to uh, California. Uh, mine is the Central District. Submit. Okay. Now, I have the ability to actually file into my case. So, so if you have the ability to file into a case, you would go here to civil, and then you would go to, like, what are you filing? Are you filing... Uh, service of process, meaning did you did you serve the summons and now you need to file that you you com you completed that action? Are you are you filing a motion? Are you filing a discovery application, discovery requests? Are you discover are you filing uh you know here's other other types of filings, stipulations, transcripts, notices, bonds, appeal documents, right? So let's say I wanted to file a um a motion. I would go here and it would say, and and I already have my Pacer account is already linked to my account. So it says filing in case, and then you hit next, right? And then it says, uh, you know, the case number next. And then, and then the first thing it asks you is what are you filing? Motion, hit next. Uh, what kind of filing for a motion is it? You can say like uh, a motion to appear, motion to find someone in contempt, motion to compel arbitration, all these different kinds of motions. So if you aren't sure what kind of motion that you need to file, this list may actually help you. And again, I know this is overwhelming. That's the way it is. You, you just have to slowly make your way through this. If you think that attorneys know more than maybe a few of these or, or, a, or a handful of these, uh, you're you're very wrong. Uh, most of this is not used by most people most of the time. So it may look like a long list, uh, but you know whatever. Okay. And if you don't know, then you just find the one that's the closest. And there's actual case law that pro se litigants they have to go pretty easy on you as a pro se litigant. It's one of the huge benefits of being pro se. Um, or sui juris. I know there's been a lot of talk about that too. Is it sui juris? Is it is it pro se? Doesn't fucking matter. I hate that stupid fucking question. That's a question that is asked by people who are not litigating and will not litigate. They're fucking retards and they piss me off. What's, it doesn't the, fucking matter. What's the question? Pro se versus sui juris. Ah. Uh. Doesn't matter. You're I I don't I'm not litigating as myself as a natural person. I'm litigating via the all caps. And so legis. You have to because that's the jury. Yeah, I don't care. Caps is in the jurisdiction. Pro se is fine when you do it that way. Who cares? I'm not even in the fucking courtroom. It's the fucking it's the fucking all caps name that's in the courtroom. Why do I give a shit? I could care less. So, yeah, so if someone filed a lawsuit against you, it would actually be against your all caps. You're in well, it is against it, it. It is either way, whether whether they want it to be or not, it doesn't matter, right? So. Back to this. So let's say let's say you wanted to file a motion to dismiss a case, which you shouldn't be doing, by the way. Uh, you should always counterclaim. Always, 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 always. Unless you fucked up real bad and you really did fuck up and, and you really are fucked. Besides that, but anything financial, anything involving the system and the matrix, you should always be counterclaiming. I mean, 
I don't see why you wouldn't counterclaim under literally almost anything that could possibly happen to you. So let's not use dismissal because it irritates me. Let's use default judgment. So we want to so so you filed a lawsuit against somebody, they never filed in, and now you're gonna file a motion for default judgment, right? So you would just do default judgment, right? And then you hit next, down low, and then you hit next, and then there's gonna ask you who's the default judgment on and who's 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 writing this, and you would say the plaintiff, and there's a bunch of different windows. And then the last window is to upload your documents, and then you hit next, and then you can file the documents in, and then they get filed under default judgment and all the information that you typed in on the thingy. Okay. So that's what this that's what this is. When you have these things linked to your Pacer account, you can do all your filings and you can do all this cool stuff here and you'll get emails every single time something gets filed into the um case. And if the if the if the if the clerk files into the case, you'll get an email. Uh if the judge files into the case, you'll get an email. If the if the defense attorneys in my in my situation cuz all my cases on the plaintiff or my clients are the plaintiff, I we get an email. Okay? So it's pretty cool. You don't have to worry about mail. You don't have to worry about missing something as long as your email is functional. You know, you can you can list the court as a priority and you can you can save their information to your email and mark them as priority and mark them as pinned. And then every single time they send it to you, you won't miss it. You'll get a pin, you'll get this, you'll get that, you'll get the whole thing. Okay. So going back to uh the query. So let's go to the query. We're gonna look up my case now. Okay, this is the uh, Brandon Joe Williams all caps registered trademark versus uh, American Express Company at L. They misspelled the name here, uh, but you'll see in the docket the correct name. Okay, so so I clicked on. I just typed in the case number. It like cut the last part off automatically, which is fine. I guess it still comes up, so we're all good. It's asking me uh, what inside this case would you like to be looking for. We're not going to. Um, specify anything. Uh, we're going to just go ahead and just run the report, just just kind of raw dogging it. Boom, here we go. Now we're inside the case. And you can see it says here pro se, right? So we're going to go down to uh, look at the, the docket, right? And here's the docket. The docket is 28 filings deep. You can see that you can see that the first, my first complaint was filed by me on uh, February 26th, 2024. So just to give you an idea as to how I think all of these cases are gonna go, uh, the 28 or 28 filings deep, and you can see here uh, minutes in the chambers, the court has, has basically stopped us from filing anything else in the case. Um, so they're I'll saying go. here, they're saying here, if defendants wish to file opposition to plaintiff's motion to strike, no reply briefs uh, shall be filed in support of the motion. The hearings on plaintiff's motion to strike and defendant's motion relief have been vacated. So, so basically, what they're saying is, is like, all right, let's wrap this up and then and then give it to us, and then we're going to figure out what the next step is because obviously this isn't going anywhere. So we're 28 filings deep into the case, and the train hasn't even left the train station. Literally, the train. So, what, so does that the train isn't both? even on? The train, the, the engine of the train has not even really been started yet. Barely. You you could say you could say the train is ready to have the engines turned on, but we're not even at that point yet, let alone leaving the station yet. Now so I'll clarify, cover how that is and why. Well, we have to go through the whole case to kind of figure that out. Okay. Okay. So but quick quick question. Do yeah, when they stop motions, is that for both parties or just for you as a plaintiff? Whatever they order. Whatever the court orders. Okay. The court can order anything. You never know. I mean, you know when you start to get used to how this works. But so um, you can see here the complaint. We went over that last time on the first video. Uh, here we have a certificate of interested parties. Here we have an application for me to electronically file into the case. Right. Um, here we have a 21 day summons that was issued by the court. Uh, here we have an assignment of a judge. Here we have notice of consent. Here we have notice of parties to, uh, of, of court directed ADR program. I don't know what that is. And then here we have an order granting application for pro se electronic filing. 
So this is where my my electronic filing was approved. Uh, self representation order, uh, but, which doesn't really make sense because I'm not, not technically representing myself, but that's okay. Everything in my documents are very very clear about that, so they can they can just kind of run it however they want. The documents are very clear. Uh, notice and acknowledgement of service. So this is the this is the affidavit that I filled out and sent in when I had uh, finished uh, processing the. Uh, we can download that one. We can take a look. This is the. Um, uh, let's see here. View selected. Right. Right. Okay. So we're going to view all these documents all in one one PDF, which is really nice. So. We're just gonna wait for that to load for a moment. Okay, so now we've we're looking at uh, notice of service of process. See, it says Brandon Joe Williams uh, in all caps by and through Brandon Joe Williams agent pro se. So, so the way this really should have my registered trademark symbol on it, it usually does. This one doesn't have it for some reason. Uh, this is just you know it was served. Uh, uh, blah blah blah, and then it's got my info right. And then, What's the implication of your of registered trademark? Doesn't that have an implication for them in terms of usage? Well, it's on it's on ninety five percent of everything. Okay. So then this one, Joey Kimbrough, right? Not a party to the case. Blah blah blah. He sent us a copy of the summons through registered through mail, and that's just him, uh, you know, saying that it's that he did it right. And then we have the same thing again, Joey Kimbrough. And then we have the evidence here, uh, Exhibit A, which shows that it was stamped and received by um, the two organizations, Cabbage and American Express. Okay. Now, what happened was is the the even though that I guess it's legal to to serve through U.S. mail, they weren't too thrilled about that. So uh, the court um, said here, uh, this is from the court, minutes in chambers regarding notice of service. Defendants Amex and Amex Cabbage are corporations. Therefore, uh, there's a certain local uh, federal code, uh, federal rule that applies. And uh, it says here, it appears that plaintiff... Uh, attempted to effectuate service of the summons and complaints under defendant's agent for service of process. Um, let's see here. So basically certified mail didn't cut it for their, they didn't like the certified mail, even though as far as we're concerned, it's fine, but there was some federal rule. So I have here, um, and I know this is a bit sloppy, this video, but I just, uh, I'm just now, like I said, I'm just now starting to talk about this stuff for the first time. So we're just gonna, you know, I might be a bit sloppy for a while, kind of like my free contract killer course. Uh, it was pretty sloppy. And uh, now I'm not as much, right? So this is the federal rules of civil procedure. Um, and I know it's a lot, but a huge chunk of it is just the whole kind of breakdown at the beginning, right? But you go down and you start to see that there's these various rules, rule 19, rule 23. Th these are the various things they're talking about. And the way that the courts operate is these local rules or federal rules are actually laws, according to them. So I have the California rules of civil procedure, local rules for the central district of California, for my district that I filed in, right? Now, luckily, you know, typically you, you're you're not going to be filing in a whole bunch of different districts. And even if you do, they don't change a whole lot. But when you look through a lot of my cases, you're going to see that they're talking about these these local rules. Right. And and what they're saying here is. Um, just basic information as to like when you when you file like this is the one that we, we file, you'll see this one in there. Um evidence on motions uh it's just saying that you know factual contentions involved in any motion and and opposition to motions shall be presented heard and determined upon rec uh, declarations and other written evidence including documents photographs blah 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 so so typically as a pro se litigant they're going to go a little bit easier on you with a lot of this stuff but um you do need to look over some of the stuff. And when they mention it, you need to uh, 
look through this stuff. Like this is a really important thing. You're going to see this. This is like almost the entire spinal cord of almost everything we filed with so far, 28 filings deep. So um, in all cases, um, except in, in, in connection with discovery motions, um, for temporary restraining orders, preliminary injunctions, uh, any motion must first contact opposing counsel to discuss thoroughly, preferably in person, the substance of the contemplated motion and any potential resolution. So typically this is called a meet and confer. And this is like the basis of everything that's going on in the MX case right now. So the defense attorney is very new. I can show you who she is and what she looks like and that kind of thing. She's uh, listed in a, in a publicly on a, on, a, on a law firm website, right? Uh, she filed a motion to strike, a motion to dismiss the case, and she never had a meet and confer with me. So she's not familiar with this local rule. Now, as I'm learning more and more and more as I'm going through this, the, the attorney will do anything to just do whatever they want. And, and it's great for us actually, like because throwing darts and just seeing if they can hit the, yeah, the they don't have a clue. Like I said, people think that these attorneys have a clue. They don't have a clue. Nobody has a clue. So when you go in and you start reading these things, you already know more. I mean, you already know more just understanding basic terminology, but now if you go in and start reading the local rules, now you're really going to know a whole lot more than them because they don't follow any of the local rules. Okay. And when you do, it's taken very, very favorably by the courts. Okay. This is basically law. So when I filed my motion to strike their motion to dismiss, which is, which just means I file a complaint, they file a motion to dismiss the complaint. And then I file a motion to strike the motion to dismiss. So everything is like, so the way it works is the way it works is if if someone files a motion, the way it works is the other party can respond to that motion, and then the initial party can respond to that response. Sure. So whoever originates the original communications or original motions is typically in the best position because they get up to bat two times, whereas the person on the other side of the equation is up to bat one time. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with just the basic structure of the court system. And like, basically you've, you've probably heard down the grapevine that like being in the plaintiff is always better and, and being in the offensive position is always better. Well, it is factually better of course. because you're up to bat twice. You're the one filing motions. You're the one doing this. You're the aggressive uh, 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 person on the, on the offensive. And when you're the aggressive person on the offensive, you get to file the motion. They get to respond once, and then you get to respond to their response. But then they can file a motion too, and then now they filed the motion to strike your motion for dismissal, and then now they write up that that uh, motion to strike, and then you can respond to that motion to strike, and then now they can respond to your response. It's like playing tennis on the court. It's like playing tennis, right? Yeah. So when you realize that's how it works, that's how you get 28 filings deep into a case, and it, the engine on the train hasn't even started up yet, so... Uh, one of the issues here is that this local rule was not followed by the defense attorney. I, I've tried to, and she's trying to get around it. She's, she even wrote a, uh, a request to have relief from local rule 7-3. And she said, because she's attempted to have a meet and confer with me, which is ridiculous. She has not. Uh, How can they prove that even? That they it's, it's ridiculous. The, I'm telling you, most of all this litigation stuff is just dealing with children which is hilarious because an attorney at law is supposed to represent children and retards. Uh, in my opinion, they're worse than their own clients. So, you would know, you have met with her if they are, if they are, if that, Oh yeah, I'll, I would drive all the way downtown LA on my motorcycle and go in mm. person. The court says preferably in person. Got it. I'd love to do a meet and confer. I'll, I'll go down there. There could be 30 fucking lawyers in a room. I'll walk, I'll walk in there by myself. No problem. No notes, nothing. It's all about being certain about your case and, and the fact that you're in the right. Yeah. That's that's the bottom line. So getting back into this, uh, we ended up using a process server. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see here. This is when we have uh, Brianna M. Bauer filed into the case as the defense attorney. She's the one you mentioned. She's stepped out. This is her right here. Now you can see from her information, she's fairly new. Uh, let me see here. 
you can see graduated in uh, 2022. Oh, wow. she's, a very, she's a very new attorney, which is probably why she was put on the case because pro se, it's like just an annoying bug that's kind of flown into your space and they're very easy to manage and handle. And they so, assume that you're just like any other pro se exactly. litigant. <laughs> they assume that I'm like any other pro se litigant and they're like, oh, yeah. here's a great opportunity for a new attorney to learn some things. Yeah. And now she's in deep she shit because how she deep fucked up. She's yeah. Which is great for me. It's great for me. Right. And I don't have any bad feelings toward her or whatever. She's just trying to learn. You know what I mean? So um, the first thing that was filed by her was the um, motion to dismiss the case. They're always, I got to tell you guys this. I have a lot of people who, who, who call me or I don't, I don't want your calls. I have a lot of people who uh, hit me up or whatever. And I'm telling you, uh, you, um, they are always, I feel like if you don't have a decent case, they may not, but if your case is actually decent, they're always going to file a motion to dismiss. Even if it's the dumbest, goofiest, most hollow, most ridiculous, most untrue, worthless piece of shit thing you've ever seen in your entire life. They will file it always. You could have a smoking gun, a dead body, and four signed affidavits, and they're still going to file a motion to dismiss. But don't they have to have some basis for the reason why they would dismiss it? Yes, but they'll just make it up. Okay. They'll do, they'll just make it up. They'll do whatever. They'll figure something out. They'll figure out some local rule that wasn't applied, some technicality, some, some technica anything they can find. They are always going to file a motion to dismiss. You can literally, you should, you shouldn't even file your initial complaint without already thinking how uh, the the mo the the motion to dismiss is going to look like. You should already be preparing for the motion to dismiss, even before you file your first complaint. Interesting. Always, one hundred percent, unless it's like you want something off your credit report and you're not even asking for money and it's like legit and it's simple. We, we, uh, Joey has one case he's doing that with and they didn't, they didn't do a motion to dismiss, but anything of any substance at all whatsoever, anywhere under any circumstance or subject anywhere, anything, I would recommend that you literally just know for a fact, 100%, no matter what they're going to file a motion to dismiss and all the motion to dismiss on all of my cases have all been failure to state a claim for which relief can be granted. What that means is basically you, you, you just said some stuff that they can't even do anything with and, and, or, or that you don't have the right to go after or something like that failure to state a claim for which relief can be granted. And you can look that up and you'll see that even here, what we're going to look at here, right? So this is the uh, like motion saying there isn't a basis to the case. Yes. Really. Yes. And and all four of my cases, it's always the same shit. They just say a whole bunch of case law and they just go on and on and on about a bunch of bullshit. And they just kind of hope you don't respond. If you don't respond, they win and they dismiss the case. They could say anything. They could say that the, because the sky is green, because the 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 daffodils grow, um, you know, this really should be thrown out. And if you don't respond, it will be thrown out. That's how it works. That's why I believe th this is why I believe the definition of the word responsibility comes from law and it means able to respond. You want to respond in opposition to everything. If they sneeze, you're going to file in an opposition. So that's important to clarify. When they file a motion to dismiss, the onus is on you to, to make a counter. If they file anything yeah. if they breathe into the docket you're in opposition okay and, and you'll see judge, that the judge is not making a, a, a the judge has not said a fucking word and we're 28 filings deep and we're a month okay. and a half into the case and this says may 6 so this motion was filed today says date may 6th no no this is when this is when the defense attorneys were originally trying to create a hearing for dismissal uh, okay gotcha. so dismissal hearing right but that 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 may 6th thing was canceled 
Got it. Uh, the date of this is, uh, well, actually, this might be from the. I'll I'll, I'll explain this April to you. 3rd. So, yep. okay, got it. So this is the response and the request for dismissal of my case, right? So, uh, so the way everything works in in court, and and this is also going to clear up a lot of things, is you're going to do everyone's job for them and you can complain and you can bitch and you can moan and you can freak out and you can go on reddit and you can you can file about how this is ridiculous and this is how the court system should be you could you could you could start up a, a nonprofit organization that says that you know uh it shouldn't be this way and you can spend all your money for the next 20 years and you can get billions of dollars in donations and i still don't think this will ever change you are doing the job of the judge for them you can see that here. So what the defense attorney has done is she wrote this up. Um, and she basically wrote it up. Let me see here. See, this is from April 3rd. Not too long. So uh, I don't know why that hearing is in here. So, but anyways, w what I was trying to say was, and I'm going to see if we go all the way down to the bottom, it's probably a proposed order. Yeah. Here's the order. Okay. So a proposed order granting American Express's motion to dismiss. The way it works is she says this, this is bullshit. This should be dismissed because um the 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 plaintiff failed to state uh a claim for which relief can be granted. And she cites all this case law and she does all these things. And then what she does is she goes through this whole document and she talks about how each cause of action. It does not state a claim for which relief can be granted, right? And interesting angle. So she's going into all these different things about blah, 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 blah. You know, he didn't send anything of value. You know, this is a vapor money theory, uh, blah, 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 blah. You know, and then she's getting into how a lot of these things are are criminal and like blah 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 blah. And you can read through this and you can see all the different points as she, she's saying as to why this case uh needs to be dismissed. And she has to go through every single cause of action and she has to explain every single cause of action, which is why I say if you can have 17 or 18, they gotta be real. But if you can have 17 or 18 causes of action, it's great. Because if you get if you get any of them to hook, you can pull the case into discovery. You can pull the case forward up and out of this. What what Dr. Graves calls this is called the flurry of motions. Whenever they come in here and they do, they're always going to do this motion to dismiss and they're going to do whatever. They'll make shit up. They'll do whatever they have to do. And they'll they'll just put whatever bullshit on there, real or unreal, doesn't matter. They'll make it sound real if it's not real. That's what they're good at. Uh, and they go through every single cause of action and they, she's describing every single cause of action. And then after that, she's going to do the job of the court for the court, right? So this motion, um, as per local rule has to have a declaration. So this is her declaration as per that local rule we're looking at that says you have to have declarations with motions, right? Uh, oh no, that's a certificate of service. Sorry. That's a, that's a little bit different. Wait. Notice of motion and motion to dismiss memorandum of points. Yeah. So uh, so here's the proposed order. So the way it works is uh, you are doing the court. Uh, so she wrote this. The defense attorney wrote this. So, so basically what she's saying is she's saying, these are all the reasons why this case needs to be dismissed. And then here's a proposed order. I've already done your job for you, You're judge. keeping her employed, Brandon. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. All these attorneys that you're going to be dealing with as a pro se litigant, they love you and they hate you. They hate you because they want to destroy you and they love you because you're the one paying all their bills. So it's a yeah. love-hate relationship. People think that they're big and scary. People think that they hate you. It, a lot of it's just an act. There's, there's a huge sure. part of them that love you because you are paying all their bills, especially with these gigantic cases that drag on and on and on forever. This is absolutely perfect because most attorneys get paid on what's called billables. Sure. So what they want to do is they love this kind of shit and they want to write up all minute. sorts. They want to get all sorts of bullshit and put it in there. Right. And they want this case to drag out until the end of the end of the earth. 
So yeah. you have two issues. The issue, the issue, the main issue you're going to be dealing with when you get into litigation is not necessarily winning or losing. It's, 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 it's the fact that the, the, the attorneys, the defense attorneys, they'll just, they'll just make shit up left, right, and center, because that means there's more shit to talk about. More shit to talk about means more billables. So I guess the question would be from a strategic perspective, how do you stem that tide? If you can, you can keep things short and keep things pithy and you can, you can just annihilate things. And what I do is I always, always try as much as I can to just redirect the case back to uh, getting the complaint answered. You'll notice in all my cases, none of these attorneys want to answer my complaint. And that makes perfect sense because if they answer it, they're, 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 they're gone. They're done. It's a lot of redirection and misdirection. There are, so basically everything you're going to see in all four of my cases is nothing but frantic, psychotic redirection. Like, like massively, massive psychotic redirection, like just, oh my God, we'll do literally anything to not have to answer the complaint. And when they do a motion to dismiss and they say, this is all BS, if it gets approved and this order that she wrote, so she writes the order, it's a proposed order. And then all the, all the judge has to do is just sign it and then date it and boom, it's done. You see? You're doing the job for the judge all the time. A motion to move the case into discovery will have an, a proposed order attached to it. And now this blah date of blah, upon consideration of blah, the motion to uh, for discovery is approved because it looks like we need to dig for more information. And I see like a, a real... Um, uh, real merit to this case, uh, you know, blah, 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 dated and signed, or I don't know how it would look exactly. I'm just making that up because I, I haven't gone into discovery yet. And then, so, so it would be a motion for discovery. It would be all the reasons why the case needs to go into discovery. It, it, it doesn't need to be, it could be just one sentence as to why the case needs to go into discovery. It doesn't need to be this fucking long thing that she got a lot of billables for this. See? So you're going to see all this and you're going to be like, oh, my God, I have to read all this. No, you don't. This is all just billables. You're just looking at billables. OK, so I, I was watching just to interject quick, real quick antidote. I was watching a, a video about common law and, and being in court under common law. And I, I apologize. I can't remember. I, I have it in my watch history. I can't remember the name of the fellow, but he apparently as a as a non judge was making orders in the court and they were sticking. Have you come across this? You can write. Yeah. So the way that the way that the the court system works is, she wrote this. I've written a bunch of orders too. Okay. The judge hasn't signed a goddamn thing on either side. I've written orders. I've written orders to to strike this whole uh, motion to dismiss. I've I've written orders for sanctions. You're going to see that um, orders for sanctions means like. Uh, Brianna Bauer is going to get hit with monetary fines for not following local rule 7-3 for not having a meet and confer with me. Okay. So sanctions is when, when laws and rules are basically like knowingly and willingly violated and, and it's basically disrespectful to the court and it's disrespectful to the law. And you can write now, now judge, uh, defense attorneys and, and prosecuting attorneys, they talk about sanctions like it's lollipops. Oh, you know, you, you're filing a, a, a fictitious thing and it's frivolous and you're harassing my client and we're going to file for sanctions. We're going to file for un, un, uh, unlicensed practice of law. We're going to file for it. And it's just, it's all bullshit. They'll say anything. They'll say anything. That's I, I've heard more. I didn't even know the definition. I had never heard the word sanctions until I started getting involved in litigation. And I don't think I hear words more than sanctions now. Everything's a fucking sanction. Oh, yeah, fucking sanctions. All they do is just intimidate and threaten you. And I think the reason why that is is because they know that A, they don't have a clue about anything I'm talking about in my complaint. B, if they do, or if anyone does, if they answer it, they are they are literally going to get wiped off the face of the earth instantaneously. Because whatever they answer as affirmed is basically proven. And I've written in a way where good luck. Uh, so the thing is, is that it's, 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 they, they do this and they threaten and they intimidate because that's all they have. 
And I don't know either, either A, they don't understand my complaint, which is most likely the situation, and they would never admit that because they're the can professionals. You give an example, I know we you probably don't want to dive too deep in it, but from this motion, can, is there like a paragraph that just demonstrates just how much they're doing that? Like a specific you know, piece of that that we could just see? That's mainly over the phone and stuff like that. They don't okay. they don't they don't get into that too much on the on the docket because they're they're they they like to bark when they know they're not being recorded. Okay, but you said in this motion, like is there a paragraph or an example here that just demonstrates that they're just trying to to just misdirect and not really hitting the points head on? Even well, <laughs> I mean, you should you should yeah, I mean you should go through the complaint. They say that for all of the Title 18 stuff, it's all like there's no private right to action. So what they're saying is, is that like I have to go through like a criminal court in order to to hit people with Title 18 because Title 18 does not have like private citizens, quote unquote, do not have the right to um interesting to 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 go there. I mean, you know, you can read all this. You can they, they say that they they're not uh you know, I said breach of fiduciary duties, and they said that, you know, there's all this case law that talks about how uh, a lender and a debtor, there is no fiduciary duty. And there's a bunch of cases where they talk about how when there's a lender and a debtor situation, the lender does not have a fiduciary duty. But then I came back and hit them with the fact that they aren't the lender. They say they're the lender, but they aren't. They're lying. Interesting. See? That's a great way of handling it. So everything that. is in opposition. Yeah. If they so much as even breathe, I'm up. Oh, they're breathing. I don't like it. I'm not into it. You see? They also said... Um, that was a good uh, example. Yeah. So breach of contract, uh, they're saying that uh, they didn't breach the contract and blah, 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 because I sent in something that didn't have any value. And because I'm talking about a Veeper money theory and there's been all these cases, blah, Which blah, 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 blah. I've never heard that term. Vapor. Money. I've never heard of vapor money theory in my life before I filed this case. I had never, ever heard of the term vapor money theory. And apparently there are cases I didn't even look at them. I figured it's a waste of my time. Uh, I, maybe I will, I probably will at some point in time, look into them or whatever. I've, I've maybe peaked a couple of them, but, but it's just not, uh, so, so these, um, basically what they're saying is, is that there is no, uh, breach of fiduciary duties because a lender and a debtor don't have fiduciary obligation. So you can see every single cause of action. I have an opportunity to win. I have an opportunity to hook the case. And once I hook the case, I can get the case to move past this point and then I can get it into discovery. And I, I feel like I haven't gotten into discovery yet, but um, Joey has, and and he tells me very clearly. And, and I've heard from many people that discovery is where you win the case. Brianna, if you're watching this, you should just quit. You should just defect to Brandon's side. Well, once I, once we get into discovery, it's going to be very, very easy because then all I do is I don't even need to do a deposition. I can just write an interrogatory and I can just ask on the interrogatory um, to to know all of the details step by step by step. Uh, question one is going to be, you know, was were, were any promissory notes on this account ever collateralized? Question number two is going to be um, uh, what happened with the collateral securities? And then I'm going to write an order to compel uh, actual accounting information. That's going to show like that they use Fedwire or the FedNow system or whatever system they use and how the promissory notes are, are, are turned into a collateral security. I'm going to ask on the interrogatory for original copies of any application for notes that was ever written digitally or otherwise as per 12 USC 412. Uh, I'm going to ask for an exact ledger that shows that this particular uh, original promissory note or whatever was sent out. And then the pro the promissory notes, the, the Federal Reserve notes were brought back in. So like just that alone, without getting into anything else is going to, is going to, I'm already going to win and win the case. And that's just like one of like 400 different things that I, I have in my repertoire that I can use to win this case. There's, there's no way this case can't be won. Absolutely impossible. Brianna, it's not too late to defect. <laughs> well, she's going to learn a lot from this case. She's going to learn a lot from this case. I mean, this is like, this is like, uh, boy, I sure would love to learn how to swim. And then a helicopter takes you out in the middle of the ocean. You don't even know where the dearest land is. And you're just dumped in the water. And somehow you make it to land. You're going to be a world-class swimmer in fucking two days. So, you know, this is, um, this is basically what that is for her. So that's good for her. She's going to learn 
uh, a tremendous amount from this case. She's going to know more than some of the attorneys that have been working there for years, uh, right out the gate, right out of school, practically. Very serious. So, yeah. Plus, she's going to get billables because this case, you know, I'm willing to take this case all the way. We have to go to trial and the whole nine yards. It's going to be easy. Oh, God. Me, swaying a jury on this, if, if she is watching this, swaying a jury on this. Oh, my God. I could wear a pink tutu, be drunk, shave my head, and get into a fist fight right beforehand, and have both hands tied behind my back, and I could sway a jury on this shit. Unconscious. You could wheel me in on a wheelchair, and I could fucking sway a jury on this. I should shit. see why you 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 part of you wants that to happen. And yeah. Oh, dude. Is it is it guaranteed that it is trial by jury? I mean, is that some that's something you have to specify? No, no. You have trial? to request it, and then we move through the normal processes. We yeah. move through this. We move through discovery. We, and if if we get through all of that, and and it's still a justiciable controversy, then we would motion the court to trial. Interesting. Well, that, so if that now the happens, thing is, keep I'll, in mind, I'll definitely be a spectator when that if and when that happens. Oh, yeah, it'll be it'll be like a lot of people probably. Well, maybe I'll even I'll, I'll I you know, you can write an order for anything. I could write an order to motion the court to trial. And then inside the order for motioning the court to trial, I could put another order that orders the court to be uh, televised live on YouTube. Amazing. And I can give reasons as to why I, I I believe that the you can have your own transcriber, right? As well. Well, there's always transcribers, and then you can always order transcripts. So either way, it's recorded. But I'm just saying, if you but inside you can bring the your order, own court recorder, so, apparently, yeah, you could do whatever you want. Yeah, and you can write orders for whatever you want. You can write an order that, let's say, for example, uh, the defense on this one started calling me a sovereign citizen. I would write an order to to bar any terms associated with sovereign citizen because that term is libelous and slanderous and, and it's not based more. on fact yeah. because I am not a citizen of anything. Right. So the thing is, is that that would be uh, <laughs> an order that I could write to the judge and I could be like, this is ridiculous. This is just used as some kind of like weird reputa reputational attack. And I would say that it's irrelevant to the case, and it's just it's just being used to misdirect the court and to basically piss on justice, right? And if 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 I write that in an order like this, like what you're seeing on the screen right now, I would write all that in in very like friendly, cool terms, and then dated, and then it would say Honorable Michael W. Fitzgerald, United States District Court Judge, and then if he sees that and he likes that and he makes sense to him, he signs it, and now that is an order of the court. But I did the job for him. You are yep. doing the job yeah, for them. You're the one who's them. making the order. But you're making the executed. order. You're making the motion. You're making everything. You're making. He reads through it. He or she reads through it. Says, like yeah, I understand this. They're like a referee. This yeah. makes sense. Thank you very much. They yeah. sign it. Let's say, for example, you want to subpoena the Federal Reserve, which is something that I might do on this case to get. I want uh, any uh application for notes or any security swaps requests whether approved or disapproved that were ever made between uh you know Brandon Joe Williams uh, all caps I don't know if they're going to need the the social security number I don't know how they're going to process that exactly but however they're going to process that I need I need to subpoena the Federal Reserve to get those records to place those rec records into this so i would motion the court into discovery and then i would write an order or i would write a subpoena and it would literally be the entire subpoena and then at the bottom right it would just say judge blah 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 and if the judge signs that subpoena and gives it back to me now i can serve it i'm not a thousand percent sure it's exactly how it works but like that's the basic gist of of how all this works. You're writing the subpoenas, you're writing the motions, you're writing the orders, and they're also writing motion subpoenas, orders, whatever, and the judge is the one who decides what documents he's going to sign. But let's say, let's say he isn't sure. He can order for a hearing and he can have both parties come together and now we're speaking about it and now there's a transcript being made and he's going to ask questions or do whatever or do this and do that to collect the information he needs to decide what order he's he's a referee yeah he's I heard a referee Chris hauser refer to the judges as a referee and now when you describe it like the process like i don't think i really understood what he meant by that but now when you describe the back and forth it's just clear even more clear that he is a referee referee you know keep in mind the judge has said nothing and signed nothing on this case at all 
and there's been no hearings. There was a hearing that was set, and then it was canceled. So just to keep in mind, uh, hearing in this case is for what specifically? Like, it could be for anything. Hearing for uh, uh, a motion. Hearing for uh, more information. Hearing for. I mean, okay. I don't know. I, I'm kind of new to all this. Still, I, I would say even if. Even if the judge wasn't totally sure about moving the case into discovery or why, maybe he would call a hearing. I don't know. Anything could be a hearing for anything. It's very so have open. You, have you already responded to the motion to dismiss? Yeah. So that's that was the 15th filing and we're 28 okay. filings deep. Right. OK. So then then she filed in and you can see she's kind of new because you can see a lot of these filings are her revising old documents. Every time you see revised. That's her filing in a revised copy. So she's learning. She's learning a lot from this, right? Probably getting her head ripped off, but that's okay. She's learning at an extremely fast rate. And it's great for me because she's screwed up so many things already that I, I have a great foothold now on the case. So it works. It works. It benefits you dramatically because when they're fucking everything up, now you got to think an attorney at law, they, they are held to full standards. They are held to the full standards of the local rules of the court. They are handled to the full federal rules of civil procedure. Now, keep in mind, everything I'm teaching you in this is on a federal case. Sure. PACER is federal cases only. So if you're doing state cases, it's a whole different system, but it's going to be like overall the same thing, but like the computer and like where you log in and all that, I don't know. I haven't done any state cases. I've only done federal cases. And the reason why is because negotiable instruments operate the same everywhere. We all use Federal Reserve notes and they are all all notes and instruments all work the same way. It's all the same shit everywhere. You endorse them and then there's negotiability and then there's this blank endorsement, special endorsement. It's all the same shit everywhere in, in the United States of America. So that's why it's a federal case having to do with negotiable instruments. Okay. So Moving, so I don't think I'll ever file an estate case. I don't see why. I mean, if I stick to and that that to me, I like that because I'm already fucking overwhelmed by all this shit. I don't want to have to do figure out a whole state system and then when you start getting into state versus state, and now all the states are different, and now you have to look into all that. On the federal, it's all federal statutes and it's just pacer, and that's it. Once you learn PACER and once you learn the federal statutes, bada bing, bada boom, you're all set in all states. So the federal courts are more expensive. It's $405 for a filing, whereas a state case could be 200 to 300. I don't give a shit. Uh, the federal courts have more resources. They seem to be better organized. And this is all according to Joey Kimbrough, my right-hand man. So the thing is, is that it's, it's, um, I like it's the federal. It's where you're going to want to be when you file. Basically. If if you're if you're looking to get into negotiable instruments litigation, I personally think, for myself, anyways, that federal negotiable instrument cases is the way to go. Because once you learn the Title 18 stuff and the Title 12 stuff from the United States Code, and once you learn the basic operation of things and the UCC, and you read UCC three. And and once you understand the basic operation of of instruments and negotiation and, and endorsements and all the stuff, then then you only need to learn pacer once. And yeah, every single sector is going to be a little bit different, like we already saw, but it's pretty much the same system. And you can use your same login as well. And it all it's all based off of the same body of statutes. Whereas state to state. The statutes could change and they have different fucking systems that look different and operate different and have different logins. So it's a pain in the ass, right? So although all of this looks overwhelming, it's in my opinion, it's it's not that bad because I'm only going to need to learn all this shit one time and then I'm going to be able to just keep and then I'm really going to have it down and these lawyers don't know any of this shit. So as I learn more and deepen myself into the federal system and PACER, I mean, I'm already probably leaps and heads. I'm already eating this brand new attorney alive. So the thing is, is that, you know, she's not even following local rules at all. Uh, she is completely off the off the train track and she's trying desperately to get back on the train track. And I'm just beating her down every step of the way. Right. So the thing is, is that when when you understand the, the local rules and you understand the federal rules of civil procedure and you understand the the the, the federal codes and you understand PACER, 
it, it's just four main things you have to understand. Whereas on the state side, it's like endless amount of shit you have to learn. Because because if one state's yeah. a little different or one state has a little different definition and they have a different login, it's just like, oh my God. It, to me, it's just like, no. You know. If so you were, so if you were to take an educated guess, and I know it's not it's impossible to know for sure, how far off in time would you say this case is from actual discovery? Well, they have to answer the complaint. Uh we're just we're literally just trying to get them to answer the complaint. And that okay. they're just they just absolutely won't on any of these cases, all four cases. What what will happen if they just keep trying to not answer the complaint? At what point is some other you like, can write an order? I'm gonna write an order at some point, and it's okay. gonna be a court order to answer the fucking complaint. Okay. I'm just learning. I'm just learning right now. Is that a specific type of order or like nope, what? just like anything else? It says order up top, comes now, Brandon Joe Williams via Brandon Joe Williams, comma. Uh, you know, we've been fucking around for a long time. You wouldn't say it like that, but that's what you're saying. Uh, blah, blah, blah. We need to get this thing moving. We need to get this thing answered. This is ridiculous. Blah, blah, blah. This is why, uh, court order to have the defense answer each point of the original complaint. Okay. You can say, just answer it. You can say, answer it. And then be more specific, affirm, denied. I don't know for each item. Or you, however you want to write it, you can write it's it's your order to write, and then the judge will either sign it or adjust it and sign it or whatever. I don't know how all that works exactly. I haven't even had. Okay, I was just curious if because I it seems like the orders fall into like a classification, so I was just wondering how that. You can order that the the defense attorney is not allowed to wear bright purple uh suits because it it you have trauma of your father wearing bright purple suits and and you believe that. The defense attorney is using that as a way to emotionally trigger you. Yeah. Okay. And and if that order gets signed, then now for the duration of that court case or whatever the order says, the defense attorneys are not allowed to wear bright purple suits. I would have fun with this then, Brandon. See what I mean? (laughs) See what I mean? Now, some people might think this is very dry and very shitty. This is actually a a, a beautiful uh, uh, exercise of logic. It's a beautiful exercise of your writing abilities. It's a beautiful exercise of sales and negotiation technology. Uh, the, you can you can use this. I, I consider this to be a rite of passage of being a man and masculine energy on this planet. I, I think either ha- either hand to hand combat, either hand to hand combat or litigation. I feel like yeah. every man on the planet should go through one or the other at some point in their life. I have not gone through hand to hand combat, and I'll tell you right now, litigation is the first thing I've ever experienced in my entire life where I feel I am going through a masculine rite of passage. Sure, you're asserting your rights. I feel like I am. This is the first time in my life where, as a boy. I am becoming a man at fucking 38 years old. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate that. Yeah, I think it's fucking cool. I think it's badass. And even if you don't win, you're going to win. You win either way. I feel like in litigation, you win either way. You always win. Well, you're if you're when you're in the right. And those of you, those of us, obviously, who've been following, you know, not just this case, but your work in the work that you've been putting forth this whole time. I mean, the whole point is to be on on the right side. Yeah. Right. Which, pre, you know, the pre, the predecessor to that, of course, is doing the study. Like you've you've been at this for about two years now, I think, if I remember correctly. Right. Yeah. So just think about that in context. Obviously, your audience knows that people who are watching in my audience, they may or may not know that. I mean, this is not this didn't just crop up in the last six months. This is like two solid years, a solid years of like being all in on studying all the statutes, the Uniform Commercial Code, negotiable instruments, the U.S. Code, becoming intimately familiar with all of these terms, and now in this in the context of litigation, which is like another layer, becoming intimately familiar with how this specific process works. You know, but this is it didn't yeah. start here. Yeah, and when you look at the the things that they're writing in opposition and the notices and the and all the stuff that they're writing, they're calling everything that I'm doing a debt elimination scam and vapor money theory. They actually aren't really talking about endorsements or negotiable no. instruments hardly at all. They're inventing terms, you know. They're just back. inventing, they're just yeah. they're just trying to say, "Oh, this is all bullshit." That's what they're trying to yeah. do. Whereas uh in actuality, either they don't know or 
or they know and they're about to get fried. So it's one or the other. You know, there's there's nothing in between, really. Yeah, because if someone doesn't really know how negotiable instruments work and they're just looking at this in a very superficial way, I can almost see why they would think it's a, a vapor money theory because they don't really understand how it works. Exactly. Right. But it's OK, because when we start getting into discovery or if we go to trial, even on this, like I said, drunk, beaten, unconscious, Where no problem. Number? No, pro you, everyone in the audience, everyone on the jury could have an IQ of like 50. No problem. That would actually be, probably be more to your advantage. Than Doesn't even matter. Try. Doesn't even matter. They could all be 170. They could all be 60. They could all be old women, young women, black, white, Mexican, men. Doesn't matter. Give me anything. And I will effortlessly, drunk, beaten, and handcuffed, I will, I will sway the jury. There's no question. Absolutely no question. And plus, imagine what I'll learn during that process. There's only there's not there's not a, a very high percentage of 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 lawyers that ever make it into a courtroom for a trial. Just make sure you televise it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So going through this, um, I fell for an enlargement of time. Uh, that just means that I need more time to file the next thing because you get time limits on everything. There's time limits on everything. Ten days, twenty one days. Yeah. So I, I needed more time because I said in here, I was like, look, I actually want to follow local rules and not just ignore them. So I actually want to actually try to do a meet and confer. So if we could just give me some more time so I can do that. Uh, and then this is, they they granted that order in part. So I asked for like two or three weeks or something and they gave me like one week or that something. That was the I judge forget. who did that? Yeah. Okay. And that's when he vacated, or no, he actually vacated that prior to that point. But anyways... He says that that hearing is canceled, right? So um, this is where the defense is filing in for motion for relief from local rule 7-3, see? And this one's actually fucking hilarious. Um, let me do a stop share it for one second. Nitpicky. No, 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 it gets way better. <laughs> let me pull up this one here. So I already have this one downloaded. It's going to cost me a fortune. Not really, but it's just not not something I'm going to download. We're just going to go into my already. I already got this one downloaded here. So let me do another screen share. So this is her motion for relief from local rule 73 which is the one that says they have to do the meet and confer so um she's trying to get she's trying to get around that rule which so again like i said the, like, the, like lifting the need to to apply that rule basically yeah but those rules are law okay. local rules are law it's like it took me a while to understand that it's like the United States code, but but for like local procedural operation. They are law. So, quote, asking for relief, end quote, is ridiculous. We have a system. The system makes perfect sense. When you're filing for a motion, you should come together, preferably in person, and talk about that motion and see if there's some way to settle. The court is trying to settle a dispute. They actually are trying. The problem is, is that... It, it, Settling a dispute means everyone stops making money. That's the issue. It's the monetary, the monetary motivation is towards additional dispute, not towards resolution. But the local no, rules for them, for them, it actually benefits them to drag it on as much. Of as course, possible. we're twenty eight filings deep, and like I said, the engine of the train hasn't even been started yet. Insane. So this is her trying to get relief from seven three, and she says that I'm crazy and blah, 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 blah. And I have a, a website called one stupid fuck.com. And she gets into all this funny stuff, right? This was actually really funny, right? So she says, she tried um, to pin that against you. <laughs> this is where it starts to get into, you, you know, they're scared of the complaint when they go straight for reputation bashing. It's, it's, it's a good indicator in my opinion. Right. So, um, ominum attack. yeah, it's like, it's like we're, we're in a, we're in a debate uh about you know global warming or whatever and you start attacking my personal reputation that's just a that's just basically ding 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 the debate's over you lost you know what i mean so um 
It says here, um, the oh, yeah. claims You're better than this. You're better than this. Come on. The claims against American Express in this matter are are not only nonsensical, but brought in bad faith. Plaintiff runs an online business in which he he offers to help others avoid their debt obligations by filing lawsuits against financial institutions like American Express. Indeed, plaintiff even blogs about this case and other federal cases to potential clients to show the success of his debt elimination scam. Now, what's interesting about this is some people have told me like, oh, you should file for sanctions on the defense attorney for libel and slander. OK, now the problem with libel and slander is, is that you have to prove that you've actually been damaged. Mm -hmm. This this not only doesn't damage my reputation, it actually is the, the more people who find out about the, the fact that this is here, they're just going to they're going to have a field day. They're going to laugh it's so like hard. Negative publicity themselves. is still publicity. So because of the way I have I have my brand set up, all negative publicity is basically positive publicity. Yeah. And I did that on purpose from the beginning. OK, yeah. so the thing is, is that uh, unless something happens where I could actually like prove to a court of law, because again, this is all public information. This is all public. Anyone can download this. Anyone can read this. So it is uh, them just making shit up and trying to attack my reputation on a public forum. So technically it could fit under, I forget which one it is, libel or slander. But again, to, to, to file for libel and slander, I would have to say this occurred, which it did. And this is the damage that this particular lies and slander cost. And in my case, at this point in time, 4.22 p.m. on May 6th, none. It's hilarious. I'm over here laughing hysterically and drinking whiskey. It's, it doesn't do anything. So I and honestly, I would feel the same way as you, Brandon, just knowing what I know. Like, I, I would just be like, bring it on. Yeah. You know? So. It's fascinating. Now, what I'm actually trying to do is the definition of the word payment means to perform on a duty obligation, a contract. What I'm attempting to do is help people perform. If you were to really boil down what I do in a nutshell is that I help people perform in the area of negotiable instruments. That's it. That's my whole website, my whole brand. Well, not not every I do other things too, right? They 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 list some things down below. With respect to negotiable instruments. This is but like my main thing right now and like my main interest and like kind of what I'm really focused on is is assisting myself and others to yeah. pre to perform properly and understand the various options of performance that they have, specifically involving uh, uh, unconditional promises to pay, otherwise known as promissory notes, and unconditional orders to pay, otherwise known as bills of exchange. Uh, specifically and explicitly, I would say the core of what I'm trying to do is assist myself and others to perform and understand the performance aspects of endorsements. If you wanted to get even more specific than that, that would be like what I'm actually really trying to do. Now, what they're saying that I'm trying to do is I'm running a debt a debt elimination scam. Just amazing uh, how they twist the language around. But see, that now the thing is, though, is that now what they want is now they want us to have a whole conversation on why or sure. why not it is a debt elimination scam because now they have billables to do so. They'll make up. They'll say that they'll say that I'm a I'm a. I'm a I'm a Helsinki it and and that I'm from Gryffindor and that I sell uh you know purple ice cream out of the back of uh, a 1964 Dodge uh, uh panel van just so we can have oh well no I'm not and here's a here's a picture of my car and I'm actually not from Helsinki and and here's my birth they're certificate trying to, to prove put it. you on the defensive and well they're just trying to talk about something so they can get paid yeah Okay, that's why so, it's so important to keep bringing it back to the principles of respect. Yeah, you're, you're all you're doing is you you are dealing with a a a I don't know what you'd call it like a like a dolphin on PCP. Hmm. Okay, and you're riding this dolphin on PCP. Okay, it's like um it's bull riding. Boom, bingo. It's like the rodeo. You're, you're jumping on this defense attorney and this defense attorney is going to do everything they can to try to throw you off. And you're up there with your big cowboy hat and your boots and you got your one hand up in the air and you're just, yeah. 
<laughs> that's basically what you're doing. And you do that until the defense runs out of things that they can make up or whatever, basically. Now, now this is in reference to a negotiable instrument case, because as long as you understand negotiable instruments, you can't lose these cases. It's physically impossible. I think people need to grasp how cutting edge this case is. Yeah. You cannot lose a negotiable instrument case. Absolutely, positively, 1 billion percent. The only way you can lose is by by not responding or not knowing how it works or 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 I don't know. I don't even really know how you could lose a case like this. I mean, if I lose we're going straight to appeals. We're going to criminal cases. We're writing indictments. We're going all the way. I'll write, I'll file in a court of, of, of federal claims. I'll go after everybody and everything under the sun when you start because, because technically, as per the information and functionality of negotiable instruments, I can't lose this case. Physically impossible. Right. And I think people might be surprised by your certainty. I, I am less so, Brandon, because obviously I've been following your work uh, as I know many people have, and obviously you have a basis of understanding. So like, like you keep saying, like when, when, when you really understand how it works, there's a simplicity to it. It doesn't, you don't have to overcomplicate it. There's a simplicity to how negotiable instruments work. It's all there in the UCC. It's easy to learn and, and to, you know, well, I don't know if it's easy to learn, but it's well, UCC three. Yeah. I, I, I bit into it and ate it in small chunks. Like, okay, for example, Trying to read UCC nine, I want to literally uh, uh, hang myself. I want to like tie cinder blocks to my legs and jump into the nearest river and <laughs> mafia style. You know, I I do not I do not know how people can read UCC nine. I mean UCC nine, I can't even get to the definition section without wanting to feed my my skull into a wood chipper. I mean, I've tried multiple times, and I I just can't even survive even the definition section. Secure, secure transaction. Yeah, just nightmare. UCC nine, and don't get me wrong, I will read UCC nine, but that that's gonna be like little like cube like bites that you give to like a fucking little sure. bunny or something. You know what I mean? I'm not. I haven't even tried to look at it in probably two months or three months. UCC three, in my opinion, is not. So so if UCC 9 was 10 out of 10 difficulty, UCC 3 is like a like a two and a half, 2.5 out of 10. In my opinion. I think I think the biggest barrier you're going to have to reading UCC 3 is just your own emotions, personally. Um but as long as you can get past that to read it. As long as you can get past that, UCC 3, I mean, it's really not all that tough in my opinion, really. Um Anyways, so getting back to this, um, moreover, plaintiff recently threatened American Express with criminal prosecution if it did not accept his settlement demand. Now, it, they have the evidence down below. We'll read it. Uh, I let them know that I was I was researching and looking into, and I had been looking into, and I am currently looking into, and I'm continually looking into how to write indictments, how to work with local DAs, the process of how an indictment gets 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 built and gets approved. And we're looking over indictments and I am going down that rabbit hole because we are going to go in that direction. If we can't get the stuff handled in a civil court, we are going to go down the criminal court lane. And if we can't get local DAs to prosecute the case, we're going to figure out why. And if there's no good reason why, then we're going to litigate against local DAs in the court of federal claims. And like, I've got a whole plan that basically like, no matter how long it takes, no matter how much work it takes, all these cases that I'm doing and all these cases that I'm about ready to file, and I'm going to file the DMV case at some point and all these, there's no way I'm losing these cases. Absolutely physically impossible. If it takes me 10 fucking years, then so be it. So the thing people is, is that attention. people be, should be paying attention to this. I mean, this is. So the thing is, is that, you know, uh, I let them know that I was doing that research and I was looking into that. And that's because I am. It says in local three, seven dash local rule seven dash three, that for motions and stuff like that, we're supposed to come together and talk about this stuff. And I, it was all written, so maybe they got misconstrued or whatever. And you're going to see the actual email. I'll show it to you. It's in the. It's down below this. 
But that was not my intention. My, I even said in the email that, look, we can forego all the criminal stuff. I don't, I don't, we don't need to go in that direction. We just need to handle it on the civil side. Um, if we're going to, you know, and that's when they broke off all communication and they said like, from now on, all meet and confers need to be in writing, which is hilarious. That's just more like ignorant children. They're like literally like little, I'm not kidding, which is hilarious because an attorney at law Boy represents and children and, and persons of unsound mind, but yet they're acting like children, right? So it's I actually hilarious. correct myself. They're not avoiding conflict. They're avoiding confrontation. It's different. They're avoiding having to answer the complaint. Yeah. Everything, all 28 filings are not all 28 because a lot of them are just all just trying to avoid answering the complaint. That's it. That's all they're trying to do. And get billables. They want to they want to avoid answering the complaint and they want to get billables. Okay. So, uh, and with that said, you know, like I said, they, there could be fifty attorneys in a room, and I'll go down there by myself on my motorcycle with no notes. I'd love to meet with them. I'd love to have a meet and confer. I'd love to get this all straightened out. I really would. So I'm not in this for the fight. Um, of course, I like learning. I mean, I mean, if we fight, I learn, and if we if we if we close, then I win. I mean, that's the way I look at it. I win either way. This is psych psychological self-defense. I mean, it's yeah. an analog to physical self-defense, right? I, I am learning so much. It's unbelievable, right? And and it's just been a, a hell of a learning process, right? So uh, when American Express requested that all future conferences to be in writing in light of this threat, plaintiff further threatened to come visit counsel's office and to tell this court that American Express willfully refused to confer with him if it did not confer with him, preferably in person. And you're going to see when, we, when I show you the emails, you're going to laugh hysterically. Just don't Go forget cabbage. about, don't forget about this sentence because you're going to get a real kick out of the email I sent, right? This first one maybe possibly could be possibly construed maybe in this way a little bit. This is just hilarious. You're going to see it when we get down there. Such behavior is wholly inappropriate and should not be tolerated. Uh, according, accordingly, they're requesting relief from 7-3 so that they don't have to meet. So what they're doing is they're kind of fabricating this psychological, I'm, you know, I'm the victim kind of, you know, did you see, guys, pay attention to what they did. They made themselves into a victim. I mean, themselves, it's like the corporation is a victim. How can that be? And they said, because we're a victim, we should be, you should relieve us from something that we have an obligation. Yeah. That's pretty much what they did. Yeah. And if you wouldn't mind, I'll take a little break here, a little bathroom yeah. break, because we got a long ways to go. Would yeah, you mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. I was thinking the same thing. Maybe okay, five good. minutes. Yeah, five or 10 minutes. Let's do that. Okay. No rush. I'm gonna pause. We're here. just going to leave it, you know, leave it recording or you want to pause it? I'm going to go ahead and pause it. Okay. And, um, and just before we get back into it, there are two things I wanted to say real quick. Um, just to. First of all, I wanted to, first thing I want to say is you're doing a really great job of explaining all this. So Thank you. It's I, my first I know, time. I, I feel like it's yeah. kind of rough personally, but it's my first time. So I hope I can be, uh, there can be a modicum of, of handicap because this is my first time trying to explain all this. And I really don't feel like I have it nailed down. I, it is my first time at the bat. You know what I mean? Sure. So I'm just sharing with you that despite that, and I get it. I mean, the first time is always going to be a rough cut. But I think despite that, you're do you are still doing a great job because I'm thank I'm, you. I'm grasping this and I'm sure the audience is. And the second thing I want to say is just personally, like I'm surprised, like this is more like I'm learning more than I thought I would, basically. Like I would yeah, you you're just it's just like if you have if you've ever dealt with kids that are screaming and punching the ground and having a tantrum, you've you're ready for litigation. Yeah. So I feel like I've just, my mind has been awakened to kind of a new perspective on it where I was a little bit, I'm not sure what the word is, like a little resistant or skeptical that I was going to get tremendous value. I mean, obviously I was open to learning it, Yeah. but I feel like just having gone through what you've shown me so far, a lot of things are making sense. I like the idea of thinking about it as psychological self-defense. I think that's a great way of thinking about it. Well, a lot of people come to me who already have litigation or they're being sued you can you can answer the complaint and you can file a, a counterclaim and you can and you can structure it the same way you would structure a complaint like what I filed as the plaintiff. Like any anytime anybody's coming after you for anything financial, bank, mortgage, 
anything. You can do what I what I'm doing. Yeah. So I think I'm, like I said, I'm personally learning. And I think this is why getting this out in front of the audience, because I think everybody is watching this, like there is something for you here. And like so many people are, are, uh, uh, unnecessarily being oppressed, like debt slavery is so oppressive. But once you start to realize that you have all the power and this is just one way of doing the swordsmanship, if you want to put it that way, this is one way of of wielding the sword uh very powerful stuff so we can Thank definitely you. i'm looking forward to seeing what you have next here yeah we'll just keep going through this docket uh i'm not going to go through the other cases we're going to we're going to just go through the rest of this docket yeah. and that'll be it okay so um so uh, this is a great document because this is where they start getting into like a lot of personal attacks um so you can see here um <laughs> A debt elimination scam. I have to chuckle every time I see that. I know. Isn't that funny? I know. Yeah. Um, in the complaint, plaintiff's claims against uh, American Express are premised on the theory that uh, blah, 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 that plaintiff is a lender. Plaintiff sent endorsed instruments and other documents not tied to anything of value, which is absolutely hilarious. To American Express's payment um, for his American Express accounts and that American Express acted wrongly for not accepting these illegitimate forms of payment. Right. Uh, how according, they always use loaded language to respond. Of course, of course. According to plaintiff, American Express's refusal to accept his illegitimate forms of payment is equivalent to peonage, enticement into slavery, sale into involuntary servitude, and forced labor. Right. Crucially, this is not the first time plaintiff has asserted these types of claims against a financial institution. A uh, plaintiff runs a business called Williams and Williams Law Group, which he presents himself as an attorney. In fact, I like how they put that in quotes. It's hilarious, right? Yeah. Um, this is where we're going to try to tie you to not being an attorney in in law at law, which is, you aren't. Well, all of this is irrelevant to the complaint. That's the beauty right. of it. It's just yeah. objection irrelevant. It's it's really actually very simple. It's so again, what happens is that when when they start throwing a trial, this temper tantrum, it's your job. Like if, if you say, take off the trash and they hit the ground and they start pounding the ground and they say, I want ice cream. And I, you, you don't, you don't go into ice cream and start talking about ice cream and start talking about it. It's just like, okay, I'm going to grab you by the arm. I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to brush you off. I'm going to repeat what I told you to do. Take out the garbage. It's very simple. The problem is that they 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 they, they want to try to get you into eight billion holes. Yep. And they're just praying to God you step in one of them. You see? And just slowing the whole train down the whole time. Well, it's all billables. Yeah. They're getting Proving paid once again. The that more we were they right do this. Along. The more they do this, the more they get paid. There's actual financial um, incentive for them to behave this way. Yeah, it's all a business, folks. This it's all a business. Saying all along, it's all corporations, yeah. for profit corporations. So the more bullshit like this that they vomit up, the more they get paid. Yeah, which is hilarious because they're getting paid like fucking peanuts, like five hundred dollars an hour or whatever it is, um, which is like nothing. It's hilarious, but anyways. So, well, I don't think these lower level attorneys are getting anywhere near that. That's probably how much the client's paying. And then the 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 main law firm pays the lower lawyer, whatever they pay him. She's new, so so who knows, you know. But anyway, secretly she's envious of the fact that you're that you're winning. <laughs> well, nothing I mean, winning or losing is 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 a is not really even something you can even winning or losing, I mean, you could be you could be right and still lose in some cases. You could be, yeah, everything could be good looking great. And then all of a sudden something happens and then poof, it's gone and they have to go to appeals. And I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'm just, like I said, I'm just learning, dude. I mean, like, think about it. The more of this stuff you learn and the more you learn how to do this, th this is the way I look at it. If I lose this case, I can go to appeals. If I lose appeals, I'll be working on indictments and criminal case all at the same time. So I've got criminal case indictments. I can if I if I can't get a criminal case done, I'm sure there's probably some way I could litigate against the DA's office in the Court of Federal Claims, which is a special court specifically to file complaints on like, 
you know, DAs and, and, and federal uh, officers. And I don't know how all that works. There's always uh, the next, there's always, there's always the next thing. I mean, it's for me to exhaust every single Avenue, especially with how much public attention this case and the other cases are getting, uh, the, the world's going to change whether I win or not. Yeah. Because I'm going to continue to publish everything I do. And, and I've got the next several years lined up of stuff that I can do to keep moving all these trains and each train and, and, and move everything along. So it doesn't really, there, there's no, like I said, there's no way I am going to lose this battle. This battle will not be lost. It is physically impossible. The only way I can lose is by giving up. We never give up and you're inspiring other people to, to file their own litigation. Their own yeah. Litigation. There's nothing. The only way you can lose is by having limits, but um, doing what I do for uh, if you're a man that does not have limits, and and I don't mean that in a way that could be construed into like violence or something like that. Obviously, right? Because my whole platform is all not you know very against that. Um, but if you have no limits in terms of time and in terms of everything else, everything that happens in my mind is simply the next learning experience. And I'll tell you right now, if I have 16 cases going, which is is how it's going to be here real soon. This year, for sure, maybe not like real, real soon, but this year I want to have, you know, more than 10, 15 cases going. So you get you get up to bat two times on every case. You have the case, and then if you if you don't make it, you can go to appeals. So you're up to bat two times on every case. So that's 32 times to bat. Then you have indictments and criminal cases. I don't know how that works exactly, but I'm assuming it'd be like one time up to bat for each of those. So that'd be 16 times three. That's, um, what is that? 16 times three. That's uh, 30 48. plus 48. 48, yeah. Yeah, so 48 times to bat. That would be basically like when I would start to feel like, well, shit. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's going to be years from now. Years and years and years and years and years. I mean, if I went that far and I still wasn't able to get anywhere, I, I don't know what I would do at that point. But um, I just don't see that happening. I see there a big turning of the tides here because the point is also for more people to start learning this knowledge and more people to take action. So it's not just you. I mean, you are pioneering this and that's great. But this is the point is we're we're building community here. The point is we're, we're it's not just one man against the world, so to speak. It's you know it's a growing movement. Yeah. Right. But exactly. it is kind of like you against the world in a way because you are pioneering this kind of lawsuit. In a way, you know if we think. About yeah. It. Yeah. So so plaintiff describes the difference between an attorney at law and an attorney in fact. Um, it says, however, a review of the California State Bar's website does not show that plaintiff is, in fact, licensed to practice law in California, which is hilarious because I don't even have any clients in California, which is even more hilarious because it's it's irrelevant on top of being irrelevant. And you, didn't, um, you never claimed to be an attorney practicing in the state of California. No, God, no. I'd say specifically that I'm not in the state of California at all. Yeah. Uh, so it's actually hilarious. So uh, in its capacity... Um, as an attorney, in fact, plaintiff offers services to help others avoid their debt obligations to financial institutions. Specifically, plaintiff assists others in filing lawsuits to discharge the debts uh, accrued on their credit card accounts while keeping these credit card accounts open so they can achieve infinite money. And then they have some quotes from my website. Well, she did her research. Well, no, she got paid. Yeah. She got paid to write some shit on a piece of paper. Okay, It's all irrelevant. So this, is all, this is all in one ear and out the other. But... This is all irrelevant. This is just an excuse to bill. Yeah. Uh, this is just an excuse to bill American Express. It has this, this, nothing on my complaint had anything to do with my personal reputation. It has to do sure. with the operation and functionality of negotiable instruments. Whether I'm the biggest piece of shit in the world or whether I'm an angel sent from God is irrelevant. It makes no difference. Completely irrelevant. Uh, yeah, just means nothing. They try to make it a battle. It's like it's the same thing. It's like the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing you're starting to see now where they say on micronations how they're saying how micronations are not are are worthless and they they hold no power and they're not recognized by the United States. It's all irrelevant. 18 USC 11 foreign government defined says irrespective of recognition by the United States. So 
They say that recognition by the United States is relevant to the discussion, but factually it is not relevant. So it would be objection. And then that objection would be in revolve, uh, involving relevancy. It's irrelevant. All of this information that we're reading right now is all irrelevant. Has nothing to do with anything. It's just billable hours. That's what it is. So we have here plaintiff emailed American Express's counsel to meet and confer uh, concerning the motion to dismiss and plaintiff's anticipated motion to strike, right? Counsel uh, for American Express called plaintiff, but plaintiff did not answer the phone. That's true. Um, I was not, I don't, I don't answer random numbers. I don't know. Right. Uh, they did email me. That's true. They did. And then we actually set up an appointment. Um, we actually set up the appointment. I think it was like Thursday. We set up an appointment for a meet and confer, I think on Tuesday. Um, yeah. On April 16th to discuss the motions. Now, uh, during that call, she said, Hey, uh, please send over any, um, settlement demands via email, uh, before Tuesday, if you want to, I said, okay, fine. So that's why I sent over the settlement demand, which you're going to see here. Um, Oh, so you guys did have a phone call. You had at least a phone call. Yeah. Well, for like two seconds, just to schedule another phone call. Oh, okay. But yes, but yes, it was very, very quick. We were off the phone pretty and fast. And then she realized how sexy you were just from that two-minute call. <laughs> she was really nice on that call. It was, it was very, a very pleasant conversation for a couple minutes. Um, I told her I'd just gotten back from Austin, Texas, and I was just tired, and I just wasn't in the mood to talk. I was actually fucking wrecked. Um mm. And so I just didn't, didn't really, I was not, you know, so I needed like at least a few days. It was like fucking like a couple days or something after I got back, it was like very close. So I was just like, not, not ready. I needed to schedule it for a few days out. Um, uh, in the letter, uh, in the, in the settlement demand, which is exhibit one, we'll get into the exhibits, um, that I was currently seeking criminal prosecution against them, but was willing to forgo these efforts if American Express accepted settlement demand, right? As a result of this threat, um, which is hilarious because that's what that's what attorneys do all the time. They threat. So it's like, it's so funny. It's sort of like um, the person who steals all the time, steals, steals, steals. As soon as you steal from them, they like absolutely completely freak out. You ever notice that? It's like a human thing. Yeah. Projection. It's projection, right? So as soon as they they per perceive that anything within two thousand miles could be considered a threat, they like totally flip out. Well, that's also an indicator of of this profession because that's literally ev everything, almost like like a huge percentage of every communication I have ever gotten from a bar card attorney has had some type of direct or indirect threat of sanctions or filing a report for it's like a yeah. mafia it's like, like a mafia yeah, yeah. They literally act like they're in the mafia basically. they act like literally children or persons of unsound mind <laughs> which is exactly they need attorneys at law attorneys at law need attorneys at law literally okay so um as a result of this threat, American Express subsequently uh requested and by the way I have a lot of people tell me like oh yeah well judges are bar cards yeah, but I don't know. I just don't I just don't think they're in the same category. We'll see. I mean, we're going to find out, but I just don't think it's the same thing. So when I say bar cards and all this kind of stuff, I'm referring specifically to all this goofiness that we're seeing here. Okay. Irrelevant billables would be a great way of describing uh ir irrelevant billables and threats is is literally Besides, okay, so so of the cases, when, when they write the response to the claims, the complaints, and they write the the motion to dismiss, I'm pretty sure like the main attorneys that are on these cases are not the one writing those because they're they're actually pretty verbose and, and there's a lot of work that went into those. Those um, were probably written by actual like upper level attorneys, but everything else in the cases pretty much is all either irrelevant. Um, irrelevant abilities or or threats would fit like pretty much everything else that I've experienced in these four cases. Okay, so um, as a result of this threat, American Express subsequently requested all future conferral conferences be in writing. 
Um, let's see here. Give me one second. Um, okay. Um, we're recording now, right? Sorry, I was totally spaced yep. out. Okay. Yeah, we're recording. Uh, American Express, uh, in, in response, plaintiff insisted that he wants to meet and confer uh, with counsel for American Express in person and offered to record the exchange, which is hilarious because you'll see in the email. I don't even need to tell you about this stuff. You're going to see it for yourself. Plaintiff threatened on two separate occasions that if American Express did not agree to meet with him, preferably in person. He would notify this court that American Express willfully denied his request to meet and confer outright. Um, blah, blah, blah. This is some stuff. Um, let's see here. Just some basic functionality stuff. Um, functionality stuff, blah, blah, blah. What is this? They say I brought my nonsensical claims in bad faith. Um, when they say in bad faith, like what, how, what would be another way of, of saying in bad faith? I'm not, I'm not a million percent sure, but it's kind of like, I, I'm pretty sure what they're trying to say is like, um, like specifically for some sort of like nefarious or non-positive or, or nonsensical reasoning, like almost like fabricating something harassment or like, okay. like ridiculous, like to put someone into like a fearful state or or just to, you know, whatever. It's like, it's like bad. It's like, it's like not with the intent to confer and settle a disagreement or, or, or dispute. I'm not, I'm not a million percent sure. I've looked into it some and, and I'm just, but I'm pretty sure that's kind of what it means, basically. Um, blah, blah, blah. Please let us not follow the law. We really want to not follow the law here. Um, it's basically what they're saying when they're trying to get away from uh, local rule 7-3. Um, let's see here. Uh, have been fruitless. Is that a legal term? Have been fruitless. Never seen that before. Um, there's a lot of new terms that I've never seen before that I'm seeing in this stuff, right? It's very Express. precise their language, I have to say. Well, it's all assumptions because assumptions create billables. Mm-hmm. Our relevant billables is is the name of the game, right? American Express attempted on two separate occasions to confer with plaintiff concerning the motions. On April 11th, 2024, after plaintiff filed his motion for enlargement of time, he requested to confer with American Express concerning the motions. American Express immediately attempted to contact him. However, once the parties met, plaintiff uh, admitted he was not ready to, to discuss the motions. The parties then scheduled the meeting to allow plaintiff sufficient time to prepare to discuss the emotions. However, then it just says the this threatening letter where, where it was just the most horrible demon ever and they threatened them. Okay, so so now we're going to get into the you guys are going in for a laugh now. So now we're going to get into the um all the all the attachments and evidence and everything. So this is all the stuff that they attached. Okay. So the first one they attached was um let's see here. This is the declaration. So there has to be like a declaration attached to um, all the different things that they file and the motion to strike and all that. Here's a, they have stuff from my website, my about site, talking about the California Bar Association, all irrelevant. OneStupidFuck.com, all irrelevant. Um, all this stuff, blah, 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 all this irrelevant stuff. You can always tell, I mean, not always, because my like my first time doing a lot of this, but when there's 9,000 different attachments, typically that's just because it's all irrelevant. It's a good indicator that it's just all irrelevant. It's like, and it's you... a good indicator that they have no sense of humor whatsoever. Well, it's also a good indicator they have no defense. Yeah. Because <laughs> look at all this. They, they took my whole Exhibit A. They took my entire about page from Williams and Williams law firm.com. And they took the whole thing and they copied it and pasted it. Crazy. <laughs> Got to get those billable hours up. Oh, this is great work. I mean, this takes what 15, 20 minutes to get all this put together. It's like, how much is that worth in billables? You know what I mean? 125 at least. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. What do we got here? Let's see. Uh, 
Uh-oh, we have an issue. Hold on one second here. Houston, we have a problem. Let me pull that. I can't that. wait to see that email that you talked up. Yeah. So let's get back into this. My God, are all these attachments to that one motion? Yeah. Insane. That was 22. What if I just opened all of these at the same time? Maybe that'll work. There we go. And then 14 is going to go over here. There we go. Um, here is a bunch of a screenshot exhibit B of my homepage where she talks about in the thing. She's like that. I describe myself as a horny, racist, worthless bastard, which is hilarious. Um, again, irrelevant. They have no sense of humor. It's all irrelevant. It is even beyond that. Yeah. It's just all irrelevant. Um, but it does make it even more humorous. This is 13. So now are we going five? Is it five? So this is a just a screenshot of literally everything on my entire questions and answers page for Williams and Williams Law Firm, which is all entirely irrelevant to the case. Um, and then we have this next one, which is a, a how litigation works. It's a screenshot of my page, which is all completely irrelevant to the case. And then we have this is um, also I think how litigation works, which is all totally irrelevant to the case. And then. Here's my local and previous uh, litigation page, which is completely irrelevant to the case. Here is, here we go. Um, hello, Ms. Bauer. Uh, I'm emailing you to schedule a meet and confer as regards to case number blah, blah, blah. Please see attached agenda as well as a PDF screenshot of local rules section seven. I am assuming the reasoning behind and behind you not having a meet and confer with me for the motion you filed is in accordance with exemption 16 dash two C. Uh, but I would like to make it known that I am not in custody. So I'm not sure how that exemption would work. So, so I'm not sure. So I'm telling her that she totally fucked up in like the nicest yeah. way possible. She didn't follow local rule seven dash three. She didn't do the meet and confer. And there's an ex exemption section in that exemption section. It says that, um, if you're in custody, it can be, you can be exempt from having to do a meet and confer. Uh, I'm not obviously in custody. So I put that in the email. It's um, a polite but, way of saying that you completely fucked up. Yeah. You fucked up royally. Right. Yeah. So, um, I had a whole agenda for our call. I had a step-by-step -step thing I wanted to go over with her and everything. Um, of course she found a way to get out of it. She says, um, she does not consent to being recorded. Um, uh, one of my lines is, a uh, um, uh, so I did, um, I did actually, um, let's see. Here. So you have like a, this call is being recorded on the line. Yeah. So I, I have a different, I have a different line that I called her from. Right. Okay. That wasn't recorded because I, I was fine with that. Right. So, dear Miss Bauer, I am writing to propose a settlement to the current dispute between myself and American Express, blah, blah, blah. The terms I am proposing are very simple. So if you look at my original complaint, I have the, the relief demands are 153 through 156, right? If we can settle the situation rapidly, I am willing to waive 154 and 155. So that was like 154 was like a refund of every single payment ever made on the account since the account's inception. And 155 was the 250 million dollars. Um, big concession on your part. So yeah. So what I said was is that if they just do 156, which is the black card, um, then then I'm willing to waive all the other uh, aspects of relief. And I said um, uh, 154 is the only item that actually costs. Amex anything out of pocket. So if this settlement proposal is accepted, not only will it cost Amex absolutely nothing, I won't request even the court fees, comma, but actually Amex can begin making profit on the interest generated from the negotiable instruments on the new account right away. Uh, and then this is the part where they freaked out. 
I would also like it to be known that I have been doing extensive research into how to make a criminal indictment through the DOJ on this matter. I am preparing to create an indictment and personally contact the United States Attorney uh, Attorney's Office in the Central District of California. His name is E. Martin Estrada. By accepting this proposed settlement, I would be willing to forego those efforts and ensure that no criminal indictments are submitted or requested. And I can just... kind of see how they latched, why they latched onto that, of course. Yeah. So they're that's what I said. Any, they're looking for anything to cling on to. Sure, whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's billables, right? Right. So um, I believe these terms provide a fair resolution and represent a sincere effort to avoid further litigation. I'm prepared to sign a comprehensive release and settlement agreement contingent upon the acceptance of these terms. We have already made a meeting to speak on Tuesday, 4 16 24 at 2 p.m. PST. I am opening open to discussing these terms further and making adjustments as necessary to facilitate a resolution. Thank you for your attention to this matter. And then that's that's my this is my settlement proposal. So she fucked up here because American Express had an opportunity to win without going without losing big, without having really anything out of pocket. A bank can't really lose. I mean, when yeah. you understand how negotiable instruments work, they can't lose. So it's really insignificant either way. If anyone really knows how That's negotiable true. instruments actually work, it, it it's honestly just it's totally irrelevant. It's I irrelevant. mean, this is all irrelevant. I only wrote this for the defense attorney because I know she doesn't understand. But really, at the end of the day, it's 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 irrelevant. It means nothing to to yeah. American Express. They they could care less. It could be five billion dollars. That makes no difference. You know. Um, here's the next one. Um, please find the attached American Express's response to your settlement demand. And then interesting. Uh, they reject settlement demand you outline in your letter in light of your threat to seek criminal prosecution. This letter further serves as notice that the telephonic meet and confer scheduled for April 16, 2024 is canceled. All communications in this matter moving forward, including meet and confers, must be in writing, which is hilarious because that's not what a meet and confer is. So again, it's just goofing. It's just Little tantrums, children. tantrums, right? This is a tantrum. Yeah. Okay. Um. I have received your response to my proposal. This is me. And then there was some other people on the line that I also uh, CC because they CC on me. Um, I have not threatened anything in particular. Uh, I'm just being transparent in terms of my intention and activities. In fact, I offered to forego criminal proceedings. Uh, we need to have a meet and confer prior to my filing the motion to strike pursuant to local rule 7-3. The court prefers that we meet in person, like I showed you guys earlier, right? And I would actually be much more comfortable meeting in person, right? Now, they're all freaked out. So I'm thinking like it can be a recorded meeting by all parties if that is more comfortable for you. That was translated into, you know, he's trying to come down here and record everybody. Yep. That's not what I said. You see, or I will inform the court that you have denied the request for a meet and confer, which is like saying, fuck the law, basically. Yeah. Right. Uh, no response. I think I was like maybe two or three days later. I'm not sure. Um, that was I sent this one on the 15th at noon. And then this one was sent on the 18th at 1 p.m. So it'd been three full days yeah. and they were weekdays. They weren't weekend days because this one was sent on Monday, April 15th. And then this one was sent Thursday, April 18th. So, and I, I'm on a time clock. So you also got to think too, like, I'm like not wanting to fuck around and wait five or six days because I'm Nobody on a fucking clock, right? Wasted. Yeah. Well, no, I'm on, I'm on a clock. I have to get this done and submit it into the court yeah. within like 10 or 14 days. Got you it. know, I don't have a lot of time. So I gave her three days, but I don't have all the time in the world. So I, I emailed her again. I have not heard back from you by Monday, 422. If we cannot set up a meet and confer, preferably in person, I will literally come downtown and meet you in your office, comma. Then I will be noticing the court of a willful rejection of the meet and confer. And they they reword all this like I'm threatening them and 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 harassing them and all this kind of whatever, whatever wording that they used, basically. Right. And then um, um this is them writing a proposed order granting American Express's motion for relief from Rule 7-3. 
So no, she wrote this. Keep it going. It's just insane. So she wrote this, right? Yeah. So now we're going to go back to the docket. So that was just number 20. We just went through just number 20. Insane. So here's me writing in. Uh, let's see. No, that's her file by. Wait, revised. File by. Oh. Oh, oh, her revised document. This is my um, opposition to uh, the motion to dismiss. So we can get into this. So if you read through this, uh, you can see this is all uh, my response to their motion to dismiss, right? They they didn't add, they're supposed to add evidentiary support to, um, you know, fighting against what I had to say and stuff like that. Um, my, my, my claims are kind of self-evident in a way because my claims are like the definition of this is this and the definition of this is this. And it's like, the complaint itself kind of is the evidence. It's kind of a weird, yeah. it's kind of a weird complaint in that way because a lot of it, you can just look it up and it's all there. You don't, I don't need to like, I don't need like supporting documents necessarily. Like you can just look it up on the USC or look it up in Black's Law or look it up wherever. And do it's you all. Find, do you find it takes you a lot? Like how time consuming is it for you to put together these responses? Are you pretty fluent in this now or does it still take like a reasonable amount of your time to do that? No, no. I mean, uh, Joey Kimbrough helps me. He's my counsel. He's my right hand man. He's the one who's won a lot of these cases. So he knows a lot about like the case law and stuff like that. Got it. We talk back and forth and go back and forth and put these together and, and work together and that kind of thing. So he knows a lot about the case law stuff. And then I know a lot about like the actual structure and the actual uh, negotiable instruments and the kind of like the behavior and that kind of thing. I think I'm going to shine a lot more in in-person discussions or or teleconferences than i would in a lot of these documentations i think a lot of this this stuff is just kind of like pathetic childish tantrum hand holding yeah um it's actually kind of disgusting uh, it's like the it's like the uh, a, a complete abasement of like all human <laughs> interaction and, and it's you can, actually you can raise an objection when you're speaking in court, whereas you can't really do that with all this paper trail. Like, well, the, can, all of this, wait. all of to... this is all oppositional. Yeah, this is all oppositional. Right. So so it's all of this is all oppositional to everything she said. And then she's going to write everything oppositional to everything that I'm saying. Crazy. So that's basically what it is. Right. And like like this is really interesting, like. We haven't even fucking talked about the case or the or the, the the complaint, and they're already trying to get it dismissed. It's like ridiculous. It's nonsensical. We literally haven't even talked about the fucking complaint at all. Like not even like a word. So just going through and, and rebutting every single thing. I mean, if you can rebut literally every single sentence that they say, it's ideal. Leave nothing to chance. It's all oppositional, right? But you can read through this. I'm not going to go through all this. Um, honestly, a good chunk of a lot of this stuff is just ridiculous. The whole thing is yeah, ridiculous. it's just still we're talking about we're the still complaint. off the trajectory of the main point of the case. Yeah, we should be talking about the complaint, not all this bullshit, right? So. And then going back. Um, and then this is that that was a response to that was a notice in opposition to the motion to dismiss or motion. That was my motion to strike. The motion to dismiss. I forget it's something. Like that. And then here's opposition for the motion for relief from local rule 7-3. So again, everything they file, I'm filing in opposition. Hmm. Um notice and then the filer of deficiencies. Yeah, this one, this one um that comes to the account from the courts, right? Yeah. 
there was an error hearing information is missing so that hearing was canceled but the hearing was placed in one of my documents but that's all right they're just saying just so everyone knows that hearing that was originally approved is now canceled but the the computer like makes you type in like a hearing date you can't continue or maybe you can but i like couldn't figure it out so i like just put it in there and they're just saying like hey real quick just letting you guys know that's not that hearing was canceled and then this is them saying like okay a couple more things and then we're done and then this is reply in support of their motion to dismiss the case uh, revised. Um, I don't know what that is exactly. Let's see. That sounds important. Oh. So, so she filed a, um, a motion to dismiss the case. I filed, um, a motion. I filed a motion to strike or, or, or a motion or, or, a, or a reply in opposition to the motion to dismiss. This is the reply of that reply. Okay. So this is coming from the defendant again. So this is the one, two, three ping pong I was telling you about earlier yeah. where someone initiates and then one response and then the initiator can respond to the response. This is the response to the response. Crazy. This is the third bat on that particular. I can't motion. imagine what they're saying at this point. <laughs> uh, California district courts have thoroughly rejected the vapor money theory on which plaintiffs complaint is based on blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, uh, plaintiff has not presented any argument or case law to this court to show that he has stated any viable cause of action against American Express. Again, um, and he never can. That's that's pretty. That's like a tantrum language right there. Yeah. Well, that's, that's not just precise. That's not a that's not legalese. That's just that's like, just because every time they file the motion to dismiss the first thing they're going to do is they're going to file a motion to dismiss again it's always going to be everything that i've ever seen it's always going to be failure to state a claim for which relief can be granted that's always the reasoning behind the motion to dismiss that makes i mean that makes sense logically you could have a smoking gun and a room full of dead bodies they're still going to file that yeah, because they want to undermine the the uh, basis for the whole case. It, it, they just want to throw whatever the fuck they can out there and see whatever the fuck happens and and make billables. Yeah. Okay. Um, American Express did not violate these various rules. This is this is what I'm saying back. They didn't attach the evidence and kind of all the things like that. Um, they're saying that they don't have to. They're saying that that's bullshit. Blah blah. blah when it's actually very clear. You just read it for yourself. It's very, very clear. Um, there is no dispute um, as to the value of the documents and parcels plaintiffs sent to American Express. Um, they're, they're So basically, like, I sent a, a bunch of 1099As, right? This is way back when I, I wasn't sure what I was doing. The 1099A argument is what they're referring to here. But like now at this point, the 1099A stuff is pretty irrelevant. I actually don't really care. Um, my concern is not necessarily with 1099As. My concern is with the fact that I have actually um, uh, done a rescission of my blank endorsement and I have replaced that blank endorsement with a special endorsement on every single negotiable instrument that have ever been manufactured on all accounts since all the inception of all of the accounts. That's like primarily what I'm, what I'm talking about. They're referring to the fact they're referring here to the 1099 a, which whatever, I really don't care. I mean, I'm actually would love to have that conversation is a 1099 a, a bill of exchange. I don't know. I'm like pretty sure but but I'm not a hundred percent sure. There there there's very little on the complaint that I'm not a million percent sure on. But keep in mind, discovery can flush all that out. You never you never want to uh, allege things that are just ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like I'm pretty sure that the 1099A could possibly be a bill of exchange, but that would be an excellent thing that I would love to speak more about uh, in depth. But it's not really all that relevant. 
the most important, I mean, it is relevant because it's, it's in my complaint, but the most important thing by far is the fraud, the, the pulling of the blank endorsements and the placing of the special endorsements. Yeah. That's like 99.9% of the actual conversation. So let's say even if even if it is determined that the 1099 A's are are not bills of exchange, it still doesn't, it's still not going to stop this case. It's not even going to slow it down. It's not even gonna, it's not gonna really make any difference, honestly. Um if it's determined that the 1099 A's are bills of exchange, then that just that just tax on an extra uh hundred and seventy seven thousand dollars plus damages that I'll be entitled to, but who cares when you're looking at two hundred and fifty million? It's insignificant. Right. It's just an insignificant aspect to the case. It's like choosing your battle wisely. Yeah, I, I want to focus on what matters. And what matters is the endorsements. That's what matters. Okay. Um, talking about pro se. Um, The the uh, seven five and seven six local rules which require motions to be supported by evidence. Uh, however, plaintiff is incorrect. A court may only consider the four corners of a plaintiff's complaint when uh, assessing whether the plaintiffs. I, I mean, I don't even know exactly everything they're talking about here. It's almost like I just get so irritated. To, it's more hoops and more billable hours. It's just, it's just a bunch of just, yeah. It's just like shitting in their own Fire. hand and then like point, throwing it at me. Yeah. Yeah. It's can. just like, whatever. I don't know. Uh, Crazy. But you have to still have to respond to it, I imagine. Well, yeah. If you don't respond to it, then it, then it becomes truth and law. You're basically saying, you're basically agreeing. That's, that's kind of why, that's their whole, that's their whole plan. If they can produce a ton of irrelevant billables, something can maybe stick. Because then, then later on they'll say, you know, this one thing where you're a purple unicorn was never opposed. You see, it's like a war of attrition in a way. Yeah. So, um, uh, based on the theory that American Express acted wrongly in not accepting non-legitimate forms of payment, now they're referring, I'm assuming, specifically here to the 1099A, which again is just not. It's not the the basis of this thing, really. It's just a it's just a small little side venue. Um, so it's not even really all that important. Um, whether 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 the ten ninety nine A is or is not a bill of exchange is whatever. Uh, not going to slow this this case down even one percent. Really, it's not. Um, let's see. So they're talking about the bills of exchange here again. Um, a trademark cannot cannot create currency. I, I was just reading that. It's hilarious. They, they have no idea. They have no clue. Um, or or you're not giving them enough credit like they're just so clever like they're so they're in, in that clever mindset that they knew exactly what they were doing there yeah i don't think i don't think so man i don't think a lot of people have any clue about any of this shit to be honest with you hard to know why, why in the fuck would you be working for american express as a lawyer if you knew any of this shit you know what i mean unless you hate yourself i guess i don't know well one of my theories is that a lot of these people do hate themselves deep inside maybe I, I don't know. I mean, I, sure. I think so. Like, uh, I want to behave like a child when they're an adult. Yeah. Um. Hmm, Marvin versus Capital One. Pro se plaintiff alleged that he sent two documents, blah, blah, blah. Going to be promissory notes. So, you know, that's irrelevant. I I never sent in documents that claim to be promissory notes, you see. Um So they're referring to a bunch of cases. You can you can dig through all these cases too. I haven't done that. I've dug through some of them, but to me it's just kind of irrelevant cuz I know for a fact that my shit's super tight. 
I don't really, and I've, I've been looking at fucked up documents and fucked up shit and fucking things up myself for so long that, I mean, I don't really need to look at more of them, but I, I, I've looked at some of these and I may look at more of them. I don't know, but we'll just, you know, uh, but they're irrelevant anyways. I'm not sending in promissory notes. You, you, they already have them. They've already got the collateral security. So it's not like, it's just irrelevant. Um, every time I put my credit credit card into a credit card reader, you know, they have, they, they, they were issued a collateral security instantly digitally. Every single statement, every single piece of paper, it's all proof. i never sent them anything. I mean, I guess depending on how you can think of the definition of the word send, I don't know. I mean, I manufactured it digitally and then it digitally was sent to them on the computer all instantaneously within a split second, I guess maybe in that respect, I don't know. Um, but there are all these different things that they're mentioning is not what I'm mentioning on my complaint. They're mentioning irrelevant aspects that have nothing to do with my complaint. The only part of this that has anything to do with my complaint is just the idea that is a 1099A a bill of exchange. That's it. That'd be the only point of contention here that actually should be discussed. Everything else is not being, is not being uh, addressred. But the 99.9% .9 of my of my complaint is not being addressed, right? They're saying that uh, no civil private rights of action for his claims under all these statutes of the United States Code, Title 18. Um, this is inappropriate, again, this language that has no legal basis. See, while pro se plaintiffs are held to less stringent standards than formal pleadings drafted by lawyers, see? The liberal construction does not require the court to conjure up unpled allegations, nor rewrite a complaint to include claims that were never presented. So it's like, what, like, how far does that liberal construction go? And it doesn't go this far, right? I don't even know why they're mentioning this because I'm not asking anyone to hold my hand or whatever. I have no idea. Um, plaintiff cannot ask this, this court to rewrite his complaint to include civil causes of action. He never pled or to ask this judiciary to act as his legal counsel. So first off you can, you can always uh, write an order or, or, or whatever to add parties to the case. You can always add, you can always add causes of action. You can do whatever you want. And I never asked for any judiciary to be a legal counsel. Um, so I don't know why they're bringing all that up. Again, it's all just billables. Um, and so the only thing that they've covered in this is just, is the 1099A a bill of exchange? That's the only point of contention that has been brought up in this. But that's just a very, very, very small part of my of my complaint. Yeah. I don't think they, they either don't understand the complaint or I don't know. I don't know what it is. The meet and confer, or if we could actually do it, and they refuse to do it. But if we could actually somehow get because them. Because they know done, that they're in trouble when they do that. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I would be more than happy to meet and confer, and we can figure it all out. Um, because that, as far as I'm concerned, the only point on my entire complaint that is up for discussion is, is the 1099A form a bill of exchange? I would like to have that conversation. I would like to learn more about is it or is it not? Um, I believe it very well could be. Uh, but but like I said, I'm I'm very much up for discussion on that. In terms of all the other stuff, uh, all the promissory notes on the account being generated every time I use my credit card, the endorsements, the special endorsement versus blank endorsement, all of that is is completely not up for discussion. Absolutely not. I'll talk about it. I'll educate. We can have some fun, but but there's nothing that I'm going to learn probably that that's going to be new or or anything like that. I mean, UCC three is pretty fucking clear, so they're just trying to fuck around on that. And luckily, that's ninety nine point eight percent of my entire complaint. Not is the ten ninety nine a bill of exchange. That's not. That's like a very small, very small aspect about all this, honestly. And if I would have known now what I knew then, I, I would have just not even done that. I would have just focused on on the the endorsements. But because I had sent that in, I think it'd be a good discussion to have. I'd like to learn more about that 
personally um and and see if maybe i could learn something in that area but but i don't think i'm not like closed down to learning it's not like i'm like fuck everybody like blah blah, blah about negotiable instruments and, and 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 endorsements i just don't think you know you read ucc3 and everything and it's just like there's just no way that that my complaint is going to get undermined and i mean there's just no fucking way man physically impossible i mean look at how hard they're trying to not answer the complaint sure if anything their their resistance is demonstrating how strong the case is because why would they have to go and flail and throw rocks and do all these things if if you didn't have a solid case they would be able to they would have been successful in dismissing it right yeah. in my opinion if it was not if it was baseless well we have to do the meet and confer in order to have a motion to dismiss anyway so the whole thing is is fucked anyways because we never did we never did a, a meet and confer so all of these motions are all fucked because they're none of them you know local rule 7-3 was not followed we're supposed to be the meet and confer and again this is my this is my first time up to bat um i am learning these last couple is just more bullshit uh we're, we're definitely both starting to kind of like it gets shorter and it gets kind of like 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 less crazy on these last two filings because there's just like everything's already been said and there's just like we both know this is the very last time we're going to be able to file. So these last two filings are are shorter and and whatever. And this is the last one that I filed. So what what could happen next? Well, actually, well, let's go take a look at this last filing. So this was just like five days ago. So this is my my reply to their reply. Okay. Um, and you don't get infinite replies, is that right? Like it's just like no, one, no, no, no. It's the it's like a one two three. Remember ping pong ping. Oh uh, yeah. It's the it's the originator reply and then originators reply to reply. Okay, got it. Now, now during that one, two, three ping pong, party B can initiate an entirely separate motion. So now you have a three point ping pong on the plaintiff side, and then you now you also have a three point ping pong on the defense side going simultaneously. That's a lot of what you've seen in this docket, and that's why the docket's twenty eight filings deep. And like I said, the train hasn't even started its engines yet. But you also got to keep in mind, let's say they call me tomorrow. Let's say their let's say their motion to dismiss is is stricken and they immediately call me and they go, fuck it. We're we're gonna give you a black card. That's it. The case is done. The case closes. It's it's over. So that the end the train the train engine was never started. Yep. The train yep. never left the, the 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 station, and that's it. It's all over. So my question is, because money is not, you know, money, we're, we're not, it's really currency, because the amount that they could pay in penalties is not really relevant. It's irrelevant. What would, what would be their, does, what would incentivize them or what would be their reason to, to capitulate? I don't know. I guess going criminal. That's kind of another, one of the reasons why I've been looking into that so much. A criminal case. Yeah. So you were probably did the right thing by mentioning that to them. I, I, I'm not, dude, I'm like legit not trying to like sway them or manipulate them in any way. Like, I'm just like straight up as fuck. Like I was already doing research and like the, the local rule seven dash three says that like, you should be transparent and like what you're doing and your motions. And I just, it's like, fuck it. Like I'm, I'm doing this and I continue to do this and I'm just going to let them know. And I didn't think they'd freak out. I don't really care. They can freak out all they want. They get their billables. I don't know. I'm just learning. Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, I'm in the edge of my seat. It's like watching a good movie. <laughs> yeah. And then my other cases have all sorts of filings too. The first case with um, Dan Hollerman and Compass, yeah. that one's got probably, I don't even know, 20 something filings in it. And then the other two are are, are quite a bit, quite a bit more quiet. Um, the first one and this one are both pretty, pretty wild, but the other two are, are quite a bit more quiet. The one for the business loan for AG Texas, uh, that one we've been waiting forever to get uh, my client to get um, approval for electronic filing. He just finally got it. It's like they've been like fucking sleeping on it. So we're that that case is just starting to kind of get popping like this one, but that doesn't mean still it doesn't mean it just means that we're starting the process of going through all the same bullshit again on the other cases. All the cases are all in. The Amex case, I believe, is like, well, no, I think the first case and the Amex case are the first ones to where it's it's exhausted and now the court has to respond. So so it it's it's like we haven't even had a court respond into one of the cases really yet, I don't think. 
So maybe show us, you don't have to show us the whole document, but maybe just show us like one or two key points from this response, just so we can kind of see how you handled it. Just, you know, you can download these and look at it. Um, there's case law in here and, you know, it's just uh, def defendants have dismissed plaintiff's arguments as meritless without providing any substantial evidence or legal justification for such a claim. Same thing with scam. They say that I'm running a, a debt elimination scam and I'm I'm trying to assist people to not perform. Well, my language is perform. They're saying not whatever on a debt obligation. They don't use the word perform. I don't know why. They don't know anything about negotiable instruments, I guess. Um, so, you know, uh, payment means performance, the legal definition yeah. of payment. So, so performance is really what it is. Um, anyways, so, um, it is required that a claim be dismissed only when it is apparent that no relief could be granted under any set of facts that could be proven consistent with allegation allegations. Defendant's failure to substantiate their dismissal with evidence renders their assertions procedurally inadequate, right? Misleading the court. Um, they, the def um, plaint plaintiff uh, believes the defendant's unsupported declarations are an attempt to mislead the court because they're just they're just talking about my website and like, oh my God, it's like obviously extremely irrelevant. This is a negotiable instruments case. It's hilarious. Um, uh, defendants assert that their motion to dismiss does not necessitate the submission of evidence. However, in, in, in Trinzi versus Pagliero, a motion to dismiss requires factual grounding through evidence or affidavits. Now they put declarations in, but a declaration is not an affidavit because you got to keep in mind if they put an affidavit into the case, that's under penalty of perjury. So if they put an affidavit into the case and then I prove that affidavit to be false and I prove that they knew it was false, they're going to prison. Mm. That's why they don't put affidavits into the case. They put declarations it's all, it's all into allegations, the case. Pretty much. It's all declarations. It's all yeah. horse shit. You yeah. see? So that's another indicator. If there's no affidavits, then they must not believe it hard enough. Right? Um... Bad faith allegations without proof. Defendants allege plaintiff's claims are brought in bad faith, yet they provide no evidence supporting such serious accusations. Legal standards require that accusations of bad faith be substantiated by clear evidence of such clear conduct, of such conduct. The Supreme Court in blah, 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 emphasize that a claim for relief requires more than mere labels and conclusions. Specifics are indeed necessary. Lack of conferral. They say that this has been, there have been no fruitful attempts to confer, but there, there really hasn't been any genuine attempt to engage at all um, besides those first couple calls. And we had scheduled something and that was, that was good. Uh, that was in the right direction. But then when they canceled that and closed up on me, I mean, that was it. I mean, I would have definitely loved to have had that call. Uh, I, I would prefer to meet in person. Uh, 7-3 says preferably in person. And it really should be in person. I mean, I agree with the court. I agree with the local rules. Why, why would you not? Why would you not just meet in person, have a coffee, or go bowling? I don't know anything. You know what I mean? If both parties are trying to come to a, a resolution of an issue, you know, I'll do drinks. I'll do whatever. Let's go on a bike ride on the fucking ocean. I don't know, whatever. You know what I mean? Um. Uh. So. Ch -ch -ch. Just talking about local rules. I mean, a lot of this stuff is just local rules. And it's just three of them. Seven, three, seven, five, and seven, six. Um got it. I mean, it's really it's really just uh so so that was filed on the it looks the date I saw there was the first of May. So is there a deadline for the next response? And what does that have to what what would be No, a, that's it. We're done. Everything everything has gone to the court now. Because as you said, it's like ping pong ping. So that's already done. Yeah, we've already pinged all our pongs. <laughs> so would the, does the court have to respond within a certain period of time? Or uh, that that's a good question. I, I actually don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I am learning. I am learning with all of you right now. I'm in the same boat. Well, so at least, you know, at least the motions are done. 
you know, everything's done. There's not, there's not really a whole lot else anyone can really say until, until the referee comes in and says something. I mean, that's pretty much, we're both, we're both, we've both said everything under the sun, moon, and stars. So there's nothing else to really say. So basically what's going to happen is they're either going to approve the motion to dismiss. And then at that point we go straight to appeals and then I'm going to start going into criminal. And then we start working on all the backup plans. Uh, or uh, the, the, the motion to dismiss is stricken. And then they sign my order to strike the motion to dismiss and then at that point, they have to answer the complaint. And then from there, we move into discovery. I guess we're going to find out real quick where the mindset of the judge is at. Well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot to look over, but I'm very, I'm still, I still reread my complaint every now and then, and I'm still very happy with it. I, I don't, um, I don't, I don't have any, any desire to change or adjust anything in that complaint. I think it, I think it lays out everything really, really beautifully. Um, it's mainly just definitions and basic functionality. I mean, I don't, I don't know if they see that very often. I think what they see often is this case law says this and fuck you and all this kind of thing. I don't think they they see something so emotionless. That, that's what I meant to say. Like when I said we're going to see the mindset, we're going to see if if they can have true impartiality where they're really objectively looking at, you know, because we can agree. And it is somewhat an opinion, but we can agree that you've put together an objectively strong, solid case based on truth and based on things that are actually true with respect to negotiable instruments. So we can agree to that, right? So my point is, we're going to find out really fast if the judge, the referee, has a sufficiently objective mindset that he can read through that and say, ah, you know, what I'm seeing is what we're seeing, which is we have a, a very clear case. And then we have a lot of attempts to distract and dissuade and, you know, and well, they see this shit all day long. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, this is, this is how the whole, I mean, I can't imagine being a judge. I actually kind of feel bad for them. Not like, I mean, it just sucks. Like I wouldn't want to fucking deal with all that horse shit all day long. It's like worse than a fucking being a kindergarten teacher. It's like awful. It's like, reading basically just reading temper tantrums all day long like yeah, God, they love awful. It. i mean there's got to be a judge that loves doing it. sure i don't know sure whatever <laughs> i mean but the thing is, is that it's just you know i actually kind of feel you know i don't know i don't know what life they live like i'm actually very curious i have no idea i'd love to meet a judge and find out what their life is and what they've been doing and all this kind of stuff. federal judges i believe are all placed there through presidents or whatever i don't know everything about this yeah but they're like they have like long track records. They're placed there by presidents or 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 special committees sure. or whatever the fuck it is. And it's like they've been around forever. They've been in the legal system forever. So this is not like the young defense attorney who's just fresh out of school. This is like you know a judge is a whole different ball game, you know. And I've done a little bit of background research on some of the judges and stuff like that that I'm involved in, but. I've never heard anything from any of them, and I've never spoken to any of them, and I've never had any hearings with any of them. So learning learning that and learning how that goes and and learning all the stuff and and everything it's just all i mean i'm just kind of getting started on this i don't see myself i see myself litigating more and more and more now until the day i die i don't know i mean i don't need to learn everything in five fucking seconds you know what i mean i don't know sure. i mean it is a long wanna, game if they throw the case out you can also do you can also file for reconsideration and objection so, so you can give the you can you can tell the the judge he has one more shot to to reconsider this case, and if not, it's an objection, and you're taking it straight to the appellate court, and the appellate courts can come down on these judges sometimes. So, if the judge knows that you're going to be going to an appellate court, and he knows you know how to go into an appellate court, they're typically not going to be so quick to jump on something and dismiss it unless there's good grounds for it and that kind of thing. So, so if I, if, if he does, uh, approve the motion to dismiss, there's going to be another thing, which is going to be the reconsideration and objection. And then that's an opportunity to get back in the driver's seat. If that's denied, then we go to appellate. And then I'm also going to be looking into criminal simultaneously, but appellate's right there, ready to go. Maybe. So, you know, it's just all, I want to learn criminal. I want to learn appellate. I want to learn discovery. I want to learn trial. So whatever it is and whatever it takes is just all part of the learning process. But you get a lot of times at the bat. 
So, so really it just comes down to always objecting to everything and, and being clear and being open with your communication without writing 750 pages. You don't, you know, even a lot of this stuff is just too much in my opinion. Um, the second thing is uh, just, you just never give up and you just always, and you just always anticipate the next move and you just never just learn from each individual motion and learn from each individual document and just don't get, don't, don't get hung up on trying to win, trying to win, trying to win. Cause you're going to have a very uh, unfun time on this. Yeah. If you're, if you're in it to process. learn it, I mean, think about this. If I get through this and then I go to appeals or I do this or I go to criminal or I do this, I mean, I'm going to be the most powerful attorney on the planet, basically. Uh, if I go all the way through trial and I go through all the way through appellate and I go through all this stuff and I go through everything, there's not going to be a single thing I'm not going to be able to handle. And, and, you know, so, and if you think that, uh, you know, Amex is the end of my infinite money uh, train. It's not. I'll sue every single banking institution on the entire planet. And then also I'll take on a hundred clients for every single banking institution on the entire planet. I mean, there could be 900 lawsuits all over the place. You know, it's like, I, th th this is not something that in my mind I'm going to lose. It's just, I'm not going to win tomorrow. There's a big difference. You see? Yeah, it's all about dis discipline and dedication. And I think that's what's coming across is that you are someone who is dedicated to your craft, but also dedicated to unlocking this freedom and, and specifically ending the debt slavery that is coming from improper use of the system. So it, it's really, it really just comes down to performance and it really just comes down to endorsements. I mean bringing it, you know, I, I, I said that months and months and months ago, and I've never found anything deeper or more intrinsic. And I really do at this point in time, I really do believe that endorsements is really like the core to everything. I just don't see how I can get any more basic or more deep than endorsements. It's just endorsements are everything. And, and you'll notice that they never mentioned anything about endorsements, not once anywhere. I believe in all 28 of the dockets. I don't think there's a single breath about endorsements yeah. when, when really ultimately that is the ultimate conversation. Yep. And we could probably explore that more. And we've been going for over three hours here. I mean, not, not including the break. So um, I'm sure you probably, I don't know how you feel, Brandon, but I'm getting a little bit wary and I think, this, oh, this is a good spot to end. Uh, this will be a, a really whole new level for a lot of my people. And and like I said, I apologize if it seems a little sloppy and I got kind of maybe a little bit tired here near the end of those things, but you can download all that and read it all for yourself. Um, I'm still learning a lot. I don't claim to be a pro at this stuff at all, not even close. Um, I think Joey Kimbrough is, is quite a bit more... Um, astute and 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 quite a bit more powerful and i'm very happy to have him as part of my team at williams and williams law firm um and yeah um without him you know I, I wouldn't be able to do all this at all and and without everything else and and without um how to win in court.com uh, jurisdictionary course it's a very very good course i highly recommend it um it's all text-based um there there is like a video section but it's just like not really great um, and he even says that in there. He's just like, uh, it's like, it's like just kind of some basic information. But if you're, if you're looking for more information, uh, I think the Dr. Graves course is really good. How to win in court.com without a lawyer. Um, yeah. So, and I'm just, just learning it day by day and moving day by day. And it's very, very freeing. I mean, any ticket, any lawsuit, anything that could possibly ever happen, you can defend yourself very, very easily. You can counterclaim, sink your teeth into people right away. And then also, if you feel that you need to be the plaintiff and, and go after someone, uh, it's very, very easy to do. You don't have to pay a lawyer or go through a lawyer. You can do it all yourself. Um, very, very powerful. So I'll be working on many, many more cases here over the next several months, including the DMV, which is going to be a hell of a case. And... Um, and yeah, just get up to bat as many times as I can and swing for the fences as many times as I can. And as far as I'm concerned, in the back of my head, mathematically, at some point, we'll hit a grand slam. 
Awesome. So you're definitely, you have an open invitation. If there's ever a major milestone that you want to come on and discuss with respect to the ongoing proceedings, you know, whatever happens, if you want to come back and talk about that, if it's a win, if it's a, a learning lesson, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's all part of the learning. So you have a standing invitation. So let's obviously we're going to be watching this very with a lot of anticipation to see what's going to come. And just, yeah, just know that you have that open invitation if you want to come back on to talk about what happens. Awesome, my friend. Thank you so much. A hundred percent. And also, if you want to bring Joey on at any point, I don't know if he likes to come on camera even, or if you would want him to, but we could do a three-way as well at some point. Yeah, that'd probably be fun. I don't know if he'd be down, but I can ask him for sure. He'd probably be down. That could be interesting since you guys are both working together on the case if you wanted to, yeah, just run it by him and see what he how he feels about it. Awesome, broski. Great job. So Brandon Joe Williams, obviously one stupid fuck.com and Brandon Williams and Williams law firm.com. I'm going to have the links below the video as always. So it's, it'll be super easy. And also to your YouTube channel. Um, so to my audience, I know they are, my audience already got a lot of value from the first interview we did. So I know they're going to get from the, from a lot of value from this series as well. So thanks. Thanks again, Brandon. Really. Thank you, my friend. Awesome. Have a good night, everyone.